all praise to the most high. So tonight's topic uh, is called lead us not into temptation. That's tonight's topic. Lead us not into temptation. Let's open up with the book of Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. Matthew 6 verse 9. Okay, let's open up with that. Come on. The book of Matthew chapter 6 verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Read that again. Come. No, verse 9, verse 9. Stay focused. Verse 9 again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He says, our Father, this is Christ speaking now. He's speaking to the disciples. He says, our father, he says, after this manner, pray ye, meaning pray you. This is the prayer that you must pray. Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, I want to pay, I want to focus on this just for a second. It says, our father. This is Christ speaking right here. Because the so-called Christians will make, will have you believe that the most High God and Christ is the same person. You understand? They make it seem like it's the same entity, as if Christ is a schizophrenic, or Christ was schizophrenic when he walked the earth. Read that again, verse 9. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9. Go ahead. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father. So he's letting you know he's talking about somebody else other than himself. Watch this. Give me John, okay? Give me John 17, verse 1. We're going to deal with this because Christ was not schizophrenic. Neither is he still this day schizophrenic because he's sitting on the right hand of the majesty on high. Watch this. John 17 verse 1. Let's read that. The book of John chapter 17 verse 1. What? These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, mm -hmm. Father, the hour what is did come. He say? Father, Father, the hour is come. Father. He says, Father, Father, the hour is come. So Christ wasn't talking to himself. You understand? He was not talking to himself. Read that part again, verse 1. The book of John, chapter 17, verse 1. Go ahead. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, this hour, the hour is come. Mm -hmm. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. You see that thing? So who is he talking to? He's praying to the Father which is in heaven, the Most High God. That's why he says he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Christ wasn't praying to himself. He was praying to the Father which is in heaven. Jump down to verse 5. Come on. The book of John, chapter 17, verse 5. Go ahead. And now. O Father, hmm. glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had had with thee before the world was. You see what he's saying? He says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Christ wasn't talking to himself. Because in the Christian church, they like to make it seem like as if Christ was crazy. No, they are crazy. You understand? Now jump down, read verse 21 now. Come on. The book of John, chapter 17, verse 21. Go ahead. That they all may be one, mm. as thou, Father, art you in see me. That? You see that thing? It says that they all, the all, that they is the disciples. It says that they all may be one, meaning what? They must think the same thing, that there be no divisions among them. As thou, Father, art in me. So Christ wasn't talking to himself about the disciples. Okay, read. That they also may be one in us. Mm. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You see what he's saying? He says that they also may be one in us. Him and the most High God. Talking about who? The disciples. You understand? Jump down to verse 24. Come on. The book of John chapter 17 verse 24. Go ahead. Father, I will, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. You see that? that they... Hold on. 
wait, wait, wait. Is his father again? He's not talking to himself. Is his father? I will that they also, the disciples whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Go ahead. That they may behold my glory, mm. which thou hast given me. For thou hast lovest me before the foundation of the world. You see that thing? That's some heavy stuff right there. Next verse. Go ahead. O oh, righteous Father, mm. the world hath not known thee. You see but what he's I saying? Have known thee. Hold on. It says, O oh, righteous Father, the world hath not known thee. Go ahead. But I have known thee. Mm -hmm. And these have and these have known that, and these have known that thou hast sent me. You see that, and these, that these are the disciples. It says, Oh, righteous father, the world has not known thee. How does the though because what is the reason why the world doesn't know the most like God? Neither do they know his son. Watch this. Get that in first John 2. First John chapter 2. Okay. First John chapter 2, start of verse 1. First book of John, chapter 2, verse 1. Go ahead. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Mm -hmm. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So Christ is the advocate. He says, but in, in, and if any man sin, if any man fall short, meaning what? What does that mean? Meaning you are overcome. If any man is overcome by their own sins, you understand? When you repent, guess what? It says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Go ahead. And he is the propitiation of our sins. Meaning what? And he is the propitiation for our sins. He's a propitiation for our sins, meaning he speaks on our behalf before the Father. Go ahead. And not for ours only, but mm -hmm. also for the sins of the whole world. But also for the sins of the whole world. Because right there, a Christian will confound you. Get that in Wisdom of Solomon 18.24. Let's see who is the whole world that he's talking about. Right here. When he says, and also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, read that. Wisdom of Solomon 18, verse 24. Come on. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 18, verse 24. Go ahead. For in the long garment was the whole world. Was the what? Was the whole world. It says, for in the long garment, meaning Aaron, the high priest, his long garment, he says, was the whole world. He's going to explain what he means by that. Go ahead. And in the four rows of the stones was the glory of the Father's graven. You see that thing? Because that goes into what the four rows of the stones you understand that make up the 12 stones, which represents the 12 tribes of Israel. Go ahead. And thy majesty upon the diadem of his head. You, because remember how the priests would, would dress up and only they would dress like that. They would have the meters on and so forth. Yes, he's going into that. Let's get that. Get that in uh, Exodus, okay? Because that's what he's explaining here. Exodus. Let's read that. Exodus chapter 31, I believe. Hold on a second. No, no, Exodus 28, verse 15. Watch this. The book of Exodus, chapter 28, verse 15. Go ahead. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. Mm. Really? After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and of purple and of scarlet, and of fine twined linen, thou shalt make it. So now, this is the, the, making of the, the making of the breastplate of judgment. You understand? After the work of the ephod, because only the high priest would deal with this. Go ahead. Four square it shall be being doubled. Mm. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. So the length and the breadth was of equal size. Go ahead. And thou shalt set in it settings of stones. You see that thing? Now, hold on. What we just read in Wisdom of Solomon, he is describing the whole world now. You understand? He's describing the whole world. The glory says the four rows of stones 
was the glory of the father's graven. You understand? Meaning Reuben, Manasseh, Judah, Ephraim, Benjamin, Levi, so on and so forth. Go ahead. Even for rows of stones, the first row shall be a sardius, mm. a topaz, and a, a carbon and a carbon. A, a, a carbon, a carbon. Okay, come on. This shall be the first row. So now he's describing the rows. You understand? He says the four rows of the stones. So the first row has the sardius, the topaz, you understand? The carbuncle. This is the first row, it says the sardius, the topaz, the carbuncle. This he says this shall be the first row. Go ahead, verse 18. And the second row shall be an emerald, a mm. sapphire, and a diamond. You see that thing now? He's describing the stones. Where he says, shall the glory with the glory of the father's grave it. Go ahead. And the third row, a ligger, and mm. an argent, and an amethyst. Amethyst, go ahead. And the fourth row, a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. Mm, that's some beautiful stuff right there. So now imagine you've got these four rows. You understand? You've got these four rows of these, dif of these different um, precious stones representing the, the, the glory of our forefathers. You understand? It says in the enclosing where you put the stones, it says it was overlaid with gold. Mm. Go ahead. Come on. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel. Mm. Twelve, according to their names. Read. Like the engravings of a signet. Come on. Everyone with his name shall they be according to the 12 tribes. You see that thing right there? So that's the whole world right there. That's the whole world that King Solomon is explaining in Wisdom of Solomon 18. So go back to Wisdom of Solomon 18 verse 24 again. Now we have a better understanding of what he's explaining. He's explaining the whole world. The whole world is what? The 12 tribes of Israel. Go back. Wisdom of Solomon 18 verse 24. Come on. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 18 verse 24. Read. For in the long garment was the whole world. Mm -hmm. And in the four rows of the stones was the glory of the Father's graven. You see that thing? And I was the, hold on. Was the glory says, was the glory of the Father's graven. We read that, we read, we read that when it says, uh, and the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, everyone with his name shall they be according to the 12 tribes. That's Exodus 28, verse 21. What shall the glory, he says, was the glory of the father's grave. You understand? And the stones were enclosed. The enclosure of the stones was overlaid with gold. Okay, go ahead. And thy majesty upon the diadem of his head. Now let's go back. First John 2. First John chapter 2, verse 2. Now we have a better understanding what the apostle John is explaining here. Go ahead. First book of John, chapter 2, verse 2. Go ahead. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Mm -hmm. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Meaning for all 12 tribes, because during this time, it was during the time of Rome. So when he says not for ours only, he's making reference to who? He's making reference to Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Give me Acts 11, verse 19. Because during that, during this time, who was primarily in Jerusalem? Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Okay. The book Acts of Acts, verse 19. The book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 19. Come on. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice. Read. And Cyprus and Antioch. Mm. Teaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. You see that thing? Because the word had to go what? He says, the Lord shall raise the tent of Judah first. That's why it's written like that when it says, but unto the Jews only. You understand? So guess what? That's why he says, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world, meaning all 12 tribes. Primarily, northern kingdom must hear the word. You understand? So let's go back. First John 2 verse 2 again. First book of John chapter 2 verse 2. 
Go ahead. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Wait. And hereby we do know that we know him mm. if we keep his commandments. You see that thing? And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That's why when we read in the book of John, you understand? It says what it says there. Read that part again, verse 3. First book of John, chapter 2, verse 3. Go ahead. And hereby do we know that we know him mm. if we keep his commandments. Come on. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. You see that thing? He that said, I know him, and keepeth not, meaning they deny, they reject the Bible, they reject the laws that are written in it, the instructions, the applications thereof, it says what? It says there is a liar, and the truth is not in him, meaning God's laws is not in them. That's what he's saying right there. Now go back to John 17, verse 25 again. The book of John, chapter 17, verse 25. Go ahead. O righteous Father, the mm. world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known, have known that thou hast sent me. You see that thing? That these is the disciples that knew that the most High God sent Christ to what? To teach us, to die for us, and to give us the chance to get the kingdom. The disciples understood that thing. It was not a confusion for them. You understand? So, but what I'm showing you is that when Christ says, after this man, I pray ye, our father, he wasn't talking to himself. You understand? Watch this. Give me John 14, verse 8. John 14, verse 8. Read that. The book of John, chapter 14, verse 8. Read. Philip said, saith unto him, Lord, show us the father and it sufficeth us. So why would Philip say this? So was Philip crazy? The question he was asking, because if Christ was the father, this question was going to be null and void. There wouldn't be a need for him to ask the question. That's why I asked the question in the first place. Read it again, verse eight. The book of John chapter 14, verse eight. Mm -hmm. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father and it sufficeth us. You see what he's saying? He says, show us the Father, and we're going to be satisfied with that. Go ahead. Listen to what Christ says. Read. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Mm -hmm. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. You see what he's saying? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Meaning what? My father looks just like me. You see me, that's how my father looks. You understand? Go ahead. And how says thou then, show us the father? You see that thing? Why are you still saying show us the father? Because my father looked just like me. I look just like him. And Christ didn't bug out and say, you see that part right there? It says, he that has seen me has seen the father. He didn't say, look at me. I'm the father. Why are you asking that question for? Christ didn't bug out. You understand? He answered him because he understood that in these last days our people are going to be confused. That's why these things are written like this. You understand? Now watch this. Um, jump down to verse 15 now. John 14 verse 15. Read. The book of John chapter 14 verse 15. Read. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Come on. And I will pray the Father and he I will shall and I will pray the Father. And I will pray the Father. So why didn't he say I will pray to myself? He didn't say that. He says, I will pray the Father. I mean, I'm going to pray to the Most High. Just like he prayed to the Most High in John 17 verse 1. He says, I will pray the Father. Okay, come on. And he shall give you another comforter. Mm -hmm. That he may abide with you forever. You see that thing? He says, I will pray to the Father. He didn't say, I'm going to pray to myself. He didn't say that thing. Watch this. Give me 2 John verse 3. 2 John verse 3. Okay, write this down. These are very important to understand because our, our brothers and sisters out there, when we go to the streets, they like to say, no, but you know, I, I Christ and the Father are one. Meaning what? They are the same person. They are the same entity. 
That's how they think. You understand? But that's not in the Bible. You understand? Read that. Second John verse 3. Read that. Second book of John verse 3. Mm -hmm. Grace be with you. Mercy and peace. Come from on. God the Father. From and what? From, the, from God the Father. Even John understood that. He says from God the Father. Go ahead. And from the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop right the there. Son. Hold on. And from the Lord Jesus Christ. If Christ and the Most High God was one, was one and the same, you understand? Why would there be a need for him to mention and from the Lord Jesus Christ? Why would he need to do that? You telling me that the apostles were crazy? No. They were in the full spirit. You understand? They had the Holy Spirit upon them. You understand? Read on. Come on. The Son of the Father. The what? In truth, the Son of the Father. Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of the Father. Read. In truth and love. In truth and love. You understand? In meaning what? According to the law. In the Holy Spirit. So our forefathers understood that. The apostles understood that thing. Give me Hebrews 1 and 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Let's get there. The book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3. Go ahead. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Meaning he looked exactly like his father. This is John 14, verse 9 here. Go ahead. And upholding all things by the word of his power. Read. When he had by himself purged our sins. When he died. When he was put on the cross, that's when he himself perished our sins. Go ahead. Set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So you telling me that, so Christ was sitting next to himself. You, you see, you can't make it up. Yeah? This is the way in which our brothers and sisters in the Christ, that's how they think. You understand? And no matter what you say, they don't want to hear it because they don't believe the Bible. They hate God and they hate this Bible too. Give me the book of Acts real quick. Acts chapter 7. Okay. This is when they were persecuting Stephen. Watch this. Our forefathers that hated God's commandments. You understand? Acts chapter 7. Verse. Acts 7.54. Okay. Acts 7.54. The book of Acts chapter 7. Verse 54. Read. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Come on. And they were and they were gnashed on him with their teeth. And they gnashed, they gnashed on him with their teeth. Meaning what? They were full of rage, anger, hatred towards Stephen. Go ahead. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Come on. And, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. You see that thing? This is what he saw. He saw the Mosa and he saw Christ standing on the right hand of the Mosa. That's what we read in Hebrews 1. That's the same thing we read in the book of Hebrews. Okay. So our forefathers understood then that Christ and the Mosa God is not the same entity. They are two separate entities. Let's go back to Matthew now. Chapter 6 verse 9. Okay, come on. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9. Read. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, mm -hmm. our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You see that thing? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Go ahead. Come on. of Matthew chapter 6 verse 10 thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven you see what you see that part right there thy king this is the Lord's prayer it says thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven thy kingdom come so for the kingdom of the most high God to come what needs to happen 
the current kingdoms must be destroyed. That's what you need to understand. Give me that in Wisdom of Solomon 18, verse 7. In, for, in order for the kingdom to come, guess what needs to happen? The current kingdom that are ruling right now, the current kingdom that are in rulership this day, they must be destroyed so that God's kingdom may be set up on this earth and it will rule forever. Okay? Read that. Wisdom of Solomon 18, verse 7. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 18, verse 7. Come on. So of thy people was accepted both the salvation of the righteous and mm. destruction of the enemies. That's when the kingdom comes. For the kingdom to come, the righteous must be delivered, and that's what we must accept, that the, the righteous must be delivered and the, our enemies must be destroyed. These current kingdoms that are ruling right now, they must be shut down for Jacob's kingdom to take over. We got next. We must take over these kingdoms and destroy them and set them in order and teach them God's laws. That's what needs to happen. And that's what's coming. That's why you see all over the earth, the 12 tribes of Israel are waking up because it's time for us to go back into our homeland, to go back to our homeland and to come back into our rulership. Read. For wherewith thou didst punish our adversaries, by the same thou didst glorify us, whom mm. thou hast called. Because the Lord is the one, the Lord called Israel into this day from the beginning, before the world was. It says, for wherewith thou didst punish our adversaries, meaning our enemies in verse 7 that must be destroyed, by the same thou didst glorify us. So when our enemies are being punished and being destroyed, the Lord will glorify his servants, the prophets, whom thou hast called. You see that thing? That's what we need to understand this day. Until we don't, until we can understand that, guess what? We're not going to come into, we're not going to leave captivity. We'll still remain here, mentally destroyed until the missiles drop. Why? Because the Lord is teaching us that we need to understand. We need to accept this fact because this is the fate of the earth. You understand? Watch this. Give me that in Luke 1, 68. Okay? Luke 1, verse 68. When the kingdom comes, this is what needs to happen to the nations. Okay? Luke 1, verse 68. The book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 68. Come on. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, mm -hmm. for he hath visited and redeemed his people. You see that thing? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. So we need to understand, the most High God is not the God of all nations. He is the God of the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons and daughters of Jacob. He says, because he hath visited, that's the word for means, because he hath visited and redeemed his people. And who's speaking here? This is Zacharias. Jump up to verse 67. The book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 67. Read. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost. He was what? prophesied. Was filled with the Holy Ghost and he prophesied. Was filled, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. You understand? The spirit of the most said God, he was filled with God's spirit. The spirit of the Lord was upon him and he was prophesying. You understand? So what we're reading here is prophecy. Go ahead. Saying, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Because he had visited and redeemed his people which he chose from the beginning. Go ahead. And hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. That horn of salvation is Jesus the Christ. He is the scepter. Okay, go ahead. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Which have been since the, the world began, before the world was even. Go ahead. That we should be saved from our enemies mm. and from the hand of all that hate us. You see that thing? That we, this is the prophecy. He was prophesying that we, the children of Israel, you understand who God loves. The children of Israel who belong to the Father in verse 68, that we should be saved from our enemies. We should be delivered from our enemies. And when we are delivered from our enemies, what's going to happen to our enemies? Our enemies are going to be destroyed. That's what we read in Wisdom of Solomon 18 verse 7. From the, and from the hand of all that hate us. The nations, they don't love us. They tolerate us. 
The nations cannot stand us, but they cannot stand us, but they cannot live without us because they need us to what? To work in their vineyards and make their vineyards look beautiful, to take care of their vineyards. That's why they need us, they just tolerate us, but they hate and despise our gods. We need to understand that thing. You understand? Read on. Verse 72, come on. Verse 72. Wait. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. You see that thing? So the reason why he's going to deliver us from the hands of our enemies is to perform the mercy that he promised to our forefathers and to remember his holy covenant that he made with them. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go ahead. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham. You see that thing? The oath which he swore to our father Abraham. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 17. Okay? Now let's go back. Matthew 6, verse 10 again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 10. Read. Thy kingdom come, thy mm -hmm. will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He says, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We understand the kingdom. When the kingdom comes, that our enemies must be destroyed. We need to understand that thing. Then it says, once the kingdom come, the will of the Father will be done in earth as it is already done in heaven. You understand? What is the will of the Father? Get that in Psalms 40 verse 8. Let's understand the will of the Father. Okay? Psalms 40 verse 8. Let's read that. The book of Psalms, chapter 40 verse 8. Go ahead. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, the law is within my heart. Thy law is within my heart. Thy law is within my heart. So the will of the Father is his laws. So go back, Matthew 6, verse 10 again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 10. Read. Thy kingdom come, mm -hmm. thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You see what he's saying? Thy will be done in earth, meaning the, the laws of God must be taught on this earth. Meaning what? The children of Israel, we are commanded to keep God's commandments and we are also commanded to teach the nations God's laws. The whole earth will be run on God's commandments because right now it's not run on God's laws because the kingdom of heaven is not being established upon this earth. That's why the beginning of the verse says, thy kingdom come because the kingdom of heaven is not come yet. You understand? Thy will be done in earth. The will of the father is not being done in the earth by these nations that are ruling right now. You understand? As it is in heaven. Watch this. Give me Isaiah 66 verse 1. Isaiah 66 verse 1. Come on. The book of Isaiah chapter 66 verse 1. Read. Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne. Stop right there. The Hold on. What did he say? Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne. You see that thing? He says, thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne. Because what is a throne? A throne is a what? Is a seat with which a king sits. The most High God is ruling up there in the heavens with the angels, with Christ and the angels. So there's already rulership happening up there in the heavens. There's order. There's kingship. There's kingdom ruling over there. In, the kingdom of the Mosai is ruling over there in the heavens. The third heaven where the Lord dwells. So he says, heaven is my throne. You understand? Right now here on this earth, whose throne is ruling right now? The white man, Esau, Edom, Idumia. They are the ones that are ruling right now. So right now at this point, earth is the white man's throne in this time period. But his rulership is coming to an end. We need to understand that thing. Read again, verse 1. The book of Isaiah, chapter 66, verse 1. Read. Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne, mm -hmm. and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? You see that thing? The Lord must also rest upon this earth. Why? Because... Thy will, the will of the Father must be done in earth as it is already done in heaven. 
You understand? Right now, the most High God's feet cannot rest properly upon this earth because the will of the Father is not done on this earth. Our job is to be woken up and to teach God's laws and make the laws of God honorable, with, like what Christ did when he walked the earth, like he's prophesied in Isaiah 42, 21. Okay, now watch this. Let's get there. Isaiah 42, 21. Let's read that. Okay. Isaiah 42, verse 21. Watch this. The book of Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 21. Go ahead. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness. The world is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. You see that thing? The most high God says the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. So Christ will come and magnify the law and make it honorable. So likewise, we follow Christ. We do the things that he did. We must pattern ourselves after him and our forefathers that followed him. Guess what? We also must magnify the law and make it honorable upon this earth. If we were to walk after the footsteps or in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior and the apostles that followed him that taught us this day. You understand? Read again verse 21. The book of Isaiah, chapter 41, verse 21. Mm -hmm. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. You will magnify the law and make it honorable. So that's what we need to do. You understand? So now watch this. Give me the book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. Because remember what we read in Isaiah. Go back to Isaiah so we don't lose the thought. Isaiah 66 verse 1. The book of Isaiah chapter 66 verse 1. Read. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne mm -hmm. and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? You see that thing right there? So it says, heaven is his throne and earth is its footstool. Now watch this. Give me Hebrews 1 verse 8. Heaven is his throne. And in the heavens, guess what? There's rulership already happening up there. You understand? Under the most high God's dominion. You understand? It must also be established upon this earth under the Israelites ruling together with Christ on this earth to set the nations in order. Okay? Read that. Hebrews 1 verse 8. The book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 8. Read. But unto the Son, he saith, mm -hmm. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Go ahead. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. You see that thing right there? It says what? It says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So the kingdom of the Most High God up there in the third heavens, you understand, is the scepter of righteousness and is a kingdom that is ruling forever. Ever since the, the world began, you understand, up there in the spirit world. Like, guess what? Right now, here on earth, the kingdom of the Most High is not, is not yet. You understand? So right now, Esau is not the scepter of righteousness. He's not the, the, the scepter... The, his rulership is not the scepter of righteousness. And his kingdom does not rule, is not going to rule forever. That's what we need to understand. This is the final captivity. We are on our way. Esau is on his way out. We're coming next. You understand? That's what we need to understand. Get that in 2nd Ezra 6. You understand? 2nd Ezra chapter 6, verse 9. 2nd book of Ezra, chapter 6, verse 9. Read. For Esau is the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. You see that thing? Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. So Esau's kingdom is not a scepter of righteousness, number one. Two, this scepter, his, his kingdom is not going to rule forever. It's coming to an end. Why? Because we're waking up. Because it's time for us to rule now. That's why it says, and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. Once Esau is when, when Esau's destroyed, guess what? It's our time to take over. And our right, our rulership is going to be forever. Okay? Now watch this. Hmm. Give me the book of First Kings 22, verse 19. Because it says that it says what? 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So here on the earth, we must be doing what? We must be keeping, we must what? Keep God's laws, teach God's laws, apply God's laws, organize our nation, our families, teach the men how to be men, teach the women how to be women, to teach the children to grow strong families, to honor marriage, honor God's laws, and make the laws of God honorable. That's what we're doing right now. We're doing our best before the Lord returns. You understand? Now read that. First Kings 22 verse 19. I just want to show you what's going on up there. Because what's going on up there must be, must be established here on earth. That's what you see us rising up this day in these last days. Read that. First book of Kings chapter 22 verse 19. Read. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and mm. all a host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. You see that thing? So this is Makai is prophesying. He says he saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Watch this, the host of heaven. Give me that in Psalms 148 verse 2. He says they saw the Most High sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven sitting on his right hand and on his left. Okay, let's see who's the host of heaven. Read that. The book of Psalms, chapter 148, verse 2. Read. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. You see that thing? Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. So the hosts is talk about what is talk about the angels because there's a council up there. You understand? There's a temple up there. The same temple that the Moses had to put that you had to teach Israel to construct it when we were in the wilderness, moving from place to place. It was according to how the temple in the heaven looks. It was made according to it was made according to that pattern. Okay, watch this. Now. That's it on that, right? That, that's it on that. Now let's go back. Matthew chapter 6. Okay, Matthew 6 and verse 10. No, read verse 11 now. Matthew 6 verse 11. The book of Matthew chapter 6 verse 11. Read. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. He says, because remember verse 9 says, after this manner therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When we pray to the Father, we must ask the, the Most High to, what, to give us this day our daily bread. What is the daily bread that we must receive? Daily. The daily bread. Watch this. Give me that in Deuteronomy 8. Our daily bread. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let's get that real quick. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Read that. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 3. Read. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not. Come on. Neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread, by bread only. Come on. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. You see that thing? So that bread is making reference to the word of God. The word of God that must be that must be consumed or studied daily. On a day, that's why it says, give us this day our daily bread. So every day we must receive our daily bread. What is that daily bread? The word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. What is that? The Bible, the scriptures. Study to show yourself approved. That's what he's saying there right there. Okay, get that in 2 Timothy 2.15. Give us this day our daily bread. So on a daily basis, you must receive daily bread. Okay, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Let's read that. Second book of Timothy, chapter 2, verse 15. Go ahead. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Come on. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Mm -hmm. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth, precept upon precept. 
So it's a study to show yourself approved unto God. So a lot of you, you are slothful when it comes to studying and so forth, as if you are, you, you, you are not doing this to be approved of me. No, no, no. It's a study to show yourself approved unto the most high God, the God of heaven and earth. You understand? Now watch this. Um, give me Proverbs 30 verse 8. He says, give us this day our daily bread. You understand? Give us this day our daily bread. Proverbs 30 verse 8. Let's read that. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 8. Read. You know what? Start at verse 7. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 7. Read. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. He says, don't deny me these things before I die. Go ahead. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Come on. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Read. Feed me with food convenient for me. That food that is convenient for us is what? The daily bread, the word of God. What does that mean? Feed me with food convenient for me. Give me that in Sarah chapter 16, 25. Ecclesiasticus chapter 16, verse 25. Let's read that. Feed me with food convenient for me. Okay, read that. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 16, verse 25. Read. I will show forth doctrine in weight and declare his knowledge exactly. You see what the Lord says he will do? He says he's going to show forth unto us his doctrine in weight. What is his doctrine? Give me that in Proverbs 4, verse 2 real quick. Proverbs 4, verse 2. He says, I'm going to show you doctrine in weight. What is the doctrine that he's going to show us in weight? Read that, Proverbs 4, verse 2. Proverbs, Proverbs. chapter 4, and verse 2. Come on, come on. The book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 2. Read. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not, my law. Not the doctrine, the laws of God, not to forsake God's commandments. So let's go back. Wisdom of Saul, I mean, Sarah 16, 25. Let's read that. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 16, verse 25. Read. I will show forth doctrine in weight. You see that thing? It says, I will show forth doctrine in weight. Meaning I'm going to show you my word according to the measure with which your faith can receive it. According to the manner with which you have studied my word. You have applied it more importantly above all. You understand? He says, then I'm going to show you doctrine according to the amount of application that you do when it comes to my word. That's what he's saying right there. I will show forth doctrine in weight. Go ahead. And declare his knowledge exactly. And declare his laws exactly, his understanding exactly. He's not going to give you more. He's not going to give you less. He'll give you exactly proportional to according to where you are spiritually in your spiritual walk. You understand? That's why it says, feed me with food that is convenient for me. That's what he's saying right there. You understand? Get that in Sarah 6, the last verse. Ecclesiasticus chapter 6, verse 37. Come on. The book of Ecclesiasticus chapter 6, verse 37. Read. Let thy mind be upon the ordinances of the Lord. Read. And meditate continually in his commandments. He shall establish thine heart and give thee wisdom at thine own desire. You see what God says he will do for us? He says, if you meditate continually in his commandments, he says he will establish your mind. Meaning what? He's going to establish your mind to stay on the Lord. Your mind is going to be stayed on the Lord when you meditate continually in his commandments. Because, But if you're occupied with anything other than God's laws, guess what? Your mind is going to what? That thing that you occupy yourself with, that's what's going to be established in your mind, not God's laws. If, you are, if, your, mind, if, if your mind is always occupied with evil, your mind is God, is God what? Your mind will have evil in it. it will, your mind will meditate upon the evil that you feed it. And guess what? Everything you do will be based upon the evil that you feed your mind continually in a day to day because you meditate upon the evil. 
So he's saying, ye shall establish your mind and give the wisdom at your own desire. So if your desire is little, your wisdom is going to be little. If your desire is little, your understanding is going to be little. If you study little, you guess what? Your understanding will be little. If your application is little, your understanding will be little. It is going to give you exactly what you put in is what you're going to get out. That's what the Lord is saying right there. Because the Mosa is the one that gives the increase. We must put in the work, the Lord will give the increase in his in due season. But what I'm showing you here is the most High God is commanding us and listen, I'm going to give you your knowledge exactly. Some of you, you are rushing. You want to understand things that you, your mind cannot, is not ready for yet. Some of you, you do that. So that's why some of you, you rise and fall. You're always stumbling. Why? Because you're trying to get understanding that your mind is not ready for. Your spirit is not ready to receive yet. You must still be dealing with the milk. That's what the Lord is teaching us. You understand? So, but if you try to be deep, because Negro always try to be deep. You try to be deep, guess what? You will disappear in that hole that you dig yourself into. Understand that? Okay, let's go back. Go back to Zerat 16.25. Come on. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 16, verse 25. Read. I will show forth doctrine in weight. Read. And declare his knowledge exactly. And declare his knowledge exactly. The Lord says he's going to show forth his doctrine in weight. And he's going to declare his knowledge, meaning his laws, exactly. You understand? That's what he's saying right there. That's what he's saying right there. Now go back to Proverbs chapter 30 now. Proverbs 30 verse 8. So we understand what King Solomon is explaining here to us. Okay. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 8. Read. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. You see that thing? Feed me with food convenient for me. Watch the next verse. Go ahead. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Stop right there. Because he says, lest I be fool and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Now he say, who's the Lord? I got here by myself. You know why that's important? You see this part right there says, lest I be fool and deny thee. I had a Negro. He was with us. You understand? He left with his wife and his child too. He said to me, he said, yeah, you know, I've learned all that I can. I'm ready to be on my own. He was less than six months in the truth. Less than six months. But he was ready to be on his own. He said, no, I think I've learned all that I need to. You understand? I'll take it from here. That's what he said. You understand? Read that part again. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 9. Mm -hmm. Lest I be fool and deny thee and Come say, on. who is the Lord? You see that thing? Who is the Lord? Meaning, I'll take it from here. I have, I have, I understand everything now. I'm ready to be on my own and do my own thing and destroy my whole family. You understand? This way, read it again for the wretched Negro. Read it again. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 9. Read. Lest I be fool and deny thee and say, uh -huh. Who is the Lord? Read. Or lest I be poor and steal. And take thy name and take the name of thy of my God in vain. You see that thing is as lest I be poor and steal. Because now, if I don't receive things that are convenient for me, I'm going to start to do what? I'm going to start to complain and mama. He says, and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Because the stealing part comes in when you do what? Let's say you are you you think. You, you, in your mind, you're supposed to be somewhere, meaning in this truth. But you're not there yet because you have no patience. You understand? You are, you're moving like Pac-Man. Hmm? So now, guess what? You're going to get frustrated because the Satan will jump on. Guess what you're going to start to do? You're going to start to now, you're going to start up, you're going to start to mess up the brothers and sisters around you. 
So they can what? They can live this truth because you want to live. You will end up doing that because why? Now you start to steal so that disciples, the, to, to, to pull disciples after you, just like Absalom was doing. You understand? And was it 400 men that followed him and they followed him in their simplicity and they were all dumb as hell. Okay? That's the stealing part because you are a hireling. You're not coming through the door. You want to jump on my fence. It's not going to happen like that. That's what the Lord is teaching us right here. We need to understand that thing. Okay? Let's go back to Matthew 6, verse 11 again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 11. Wait. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. So daily, we must receive the bread, the laws of God, the commandments. You understand? We must study to show ourselves approved. We must apply. Don't just study, but you must apply the stuff that you're reading. The classes that are going out, your job is to apply. Okay, go ahead. And forgive us our debts mm -hmm. as we forgive our debtors. And read lead us not. Again. No, no, read, read, read verse 12 again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Hold on a second. I'm looking for something. Mm. Oh, yes. Could you give me Second Corinthians 2? We're coming back here. No, no, you know what? Read Matthew 6, verse 12 again. Matthew 6, verse 12 again. I want to hear that verse once again. Read that again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 12. Go ahead. And forgive us our debts as mm -hmm. we forgive our debtors. He says, forgive us, or he says what? He says, and forgive us our debts, meaning our sins, as we forgive our debtors, meaning those that sin against us, right? Because you see verse 12 right there? We can have a whole class about this thing. Because one thing that I want, I, I want, I want to bring to your attention, brothers and sisters, is this. This right here is the reason why brothers and sisters stumble in this truth, because they don't forgive. You don't have the spirit of forgiveness. You hold grudges. You have the spirit of bitterness in you. The root of, the root of bitterness has taken place in you. That's why this verse right here, read again verse 12. The book of Matthew chapter 6 verse 12. Mm -hmm. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now watch this. Give me 2 Corinthians 2 verse 9. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 9. 2nd book of Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 9. Read. For to this end also did I write, mm -hmm. that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. You see what he's saying? It says, I write these things unto you, that I might know the proof of you. Meaning what? Prove your own selves, meaning prove this Bible to be true by your behavior, by the change that is happening in your life. That's what he said right there. You understand? It says that you want, whether you be obedient in all things, meaning all things that are written. Go ahead. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. Come on. For if I forgive, for if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgive I it in the person of Christ. Because the apostle Paul wasn't there. So he was writing letters to the church of Corinth to say, listen, there's a brother that, did, that was overtaken in a fault. He's getting himself right. Now he's ready to be, whether be, be, be given his, um, his position back. You understand? The congregation is ready to receive and forgive the brother. He says, you do that. He says, you forgive the brother. He says, I also agree with you. If you don't forgive the brother, I also agree with you because the Apostle Paul is not there with them. He's writing letters to them to set them in order. You understand in the spirit of Christ. That's why it says, it says, for your sakes, forgive I it in the person of Christ. Read. Lest Satan get an advantage of us. Mm -hmm. 
for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now stop right there. I want you to read that verse again. Read verse 11 again. We go on. We need to understand what is Satan's uh where is Satan's devices? Read again verse 11. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 11. Read. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Mm -hmm. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Now that's heavy right there. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Because we are, that's the word for means, for we are not ignorant of his devices. What is Satan's devices? Read verse 10 again. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 10. To whom, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. Mm -hmm. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgive I it in the person of Christ. So Satan's, Satan's devices is what? Lack of forgiveness. You don't forgive your brother. You don't forgive your sister. Satan has taken advantage of you. Satan has taken hold of you. Jump up to verse 6 so we understand what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Okay, come on. First, second book of Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 6. Read. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. Meaning what? This brother was still overtaken in a fall. Now we, we, the congregation, the leadership has to bring forth judgment according to the scriptures. You understand? Read. So that contrary wise, he ought rather to forgive him. And you see what he's saying? He says, so contrary wise, he also, he ought rather to forgive, meaning what? He, or he needs to be forgiven once he what? Once he apologizes for his, for his faults, he gets his mind right, the brother must be forgiven. Go ahead. And comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. You see that thing? It says, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up. So the Lord says we must, Christ is speaking in the spirit of Christ, says we must comfort him. How? Huh? Give me that in Romans 15 verse 4. This is the comfort. This is how we comfort a brother and or sister if, if, if they are overtaken by a fall. This is how you get comforted. We what you got? Romans 15 verse 4. The book of Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Read. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Come on. That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have, might have hope. You see where the comfort comes from? The comfort comes from the scriptures. The comfort comes from the word of the Most High God, God's laws, God's correction. That's where the comfort comes from. You understand? Watch this. Give me that in Sarah 20. Okay, Ecclesiastes 20, verse 1. Sarah 20 and verse 1. Read that. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 20, verse 1. Come on. There is a reproof that is not comely. Mm -hmm. Again, some man holdeth his tongue and he is wise. Meaning when you are corrected, shut the hell up, be quiet. You understand? That's what the Lord is teaching us. Is there is a reproof that is not comely. Some correction is not going to come out nice. Why? Because now we have to, we have to bring the, the, we have to put the fear of God on. There is a reproof that is not come. Again, some man holdeth his tongue and he is wise. Because you're going to be quiet to receive the reproof to get your mind right and repent. Now jump down to verse 3. Read. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 20, verse 3. Come on. How good is it? When thou art reproved to show repentance. To do what? To show repentance. He says, how good is it when thou art reproved? He says, it is good when you are corrected, you show repentance. But if you are corrected, you make excuses. You understand? You don't see anything that you did wrong. Guess what? Here's what's going to happen next. Go ahead. For so shalt thou escape willful sin. You're gonna die in your sins. If when you are given, when you are being corrected, because some of you you cannot what you have that woman spirit. When you are corrected, you want to say something. Shut the hell up. Because if you don't want to keep quiet, me, I'm not gonna to talk to you. I'm gonna leave, leave you, I'm gonna give you up to Satan. We will deliver you to Satan because you don't want to be corrected by us according to the scriptures. 
You are basically saying only God can judge me. That's what you're saying. So guess what? You are not going to escape willful sin because now you are sinning willfully. Now you are doing it deliberately now. You don't have that godly sorrow. You, don't, you are not sorry for what you've done. Some of you are like that. You, you do something wrong, you don't apologize. You don't repent. You don't get your mind right. You understand? You hold that, you hold that hatred in, but you are the one that's in the wrong. But you're holding the hatred in. That's crazy. You understand? That's called delusion. That's called madness. The most high God is smitten you with madness. Read that thing again, verse 3. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 20, verse 3. How good is it when thou art reproved to show repentance? Mm -hmm. For so shall thou escape willful sin. When you are reproved and you show repentance, you're going to escape willful sin. But when you are reproved, you make excuses, you will not escape. What is Christ saying? You will die in your sins. That's what he's saying right there. That's what he's saying right there. Now go back to 2 Corinthians, okay? 2 Corinthians 2, verse 7 again. Come on. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 7. Read. So that contrary wise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Because if he's not forgiven, he's going to be destroyed by the sorrow that is in. But he must have got the brother must have godly soul. He must show repentance with good works. You understand? He must show forth repentance. That's what it says right there. It says, it's good when you are corrected, you show repentance. You don't show excuses. You don't make excuses, but you show repentance. How do you show it? You must apply. You must show the people that you've offended, the most high God that you've offended by doing what? By repenting from the evil that you did and not doing it again. You understand? And learning from that mistake that you've made, that poor decision that you've made that landed you in hot water. Repent. Correct it. Go ahead. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. We must call, it says, I beseech, it says, I beg of you that you would confirm your love towards that brother or that sister. But the brother must show forth repentance. So when you get corrected, you get demoted, you get cast the hell out because that will happen too. It's not because we hate you. No, it's because we're trying to show you how serious this is. We're trying, we want to be showing you that this thing is serious business. You understand? This is a do-do. Don't repeat this again because the consequences of it are greater. They're going to affect everybody in a negative way. That's why when it comes out sometimes, it comes out harsh. Why? Because we're trying to show you, get your mind right. You understand? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what we're saying. You understand? That's what we're saying right there. Now, go back to Matthew 6, okay, verse 12. Again, you know what? Get Sarah 28. You know what? Mm, go back to Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 12. Watch this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Read that again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 12. Read. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. He says, and forgive us. Remember, verse 9 says, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse 12, is that these are, don't forget the thought now. You are making prayer, you are making a prayer to the Lord. He says, you are asking the Lord to forgive you because he says, what well, as we forgive our debtors. So what is he saying? Jump up, to, jump down to verse 14. Watch this. This is the opposite now because you're asking the Lord to forgive you because you say, because I also forgive those that trespass against me. Right? Watch this. Verse 14. Read that. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 14. Come on. For if ye forgive men for their trespasses. No, 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 no. First, stay focused. Read verse 14 again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 14. For if ye forgive men for their trespasses. No. What Bible are you reading? It says, for if you forgive men, they are trespassing. It doesn't say for their trespasses. 
For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. You see what Christ is teaching? This is, giving, this is the keys to the kingdom right here. This is the civil law. In Israel, we stumble at this. We stumble at the civil and the moral. Those two, huge problems with those. Okay, read that again, verse 14, because this goes in with verse 12. You ask the Lord to forgive you because you say you forgive those that trespass against you. Watch that. Read verse 14 again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 14. Come on. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. You see what? That's the keys to the kingdom. Next verse. Go ahead. But if ye forgive not their trespasses, no. The Read the verse Matthew, again. Chapter 6, verse 15. Right. But, but if ye forgive not men their, their trespasses, Come on. Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. You see what he's saying? He says, but if you forgive men, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Now that's heavy right there. Because here you are, you pray to the father to forgive you because of the trespasses that you are trespassing against him, but you don't forgive your brother that you see on a daily. You hate your brother that you see on a daily but you want the Lord to forgive you of your trespasses. That's hypocrisy. That's some evil stuff. You see, black people don't forgive. They hold grudges. Watch this. Get that in Leviticus 19. Okay. Leviticus chapter 19. Verse 17. We're going to read that. Leviticus 19, verse 17. Okay, read that. The book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 17. Read. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. So now he says you must correct your brother. Don't hate your brother. Let's say your brother uh, trespass against you, but you don't rebuke him. Instead, you hold it in. You hold a grudge. But when you hold a grudge, you are suffering sin upon him and yourself now because now you are harboring the hatred. Go ahead. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Come on. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am you the see, Lord. You see what he's saying? But thou, he says, thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. So don't, don't, don't render evil for evil. That's what he's saying. Don't bear any grudge against the children of their people. That's what he's saying right there. Because if you don't forgive your brother, it means you are what? You have the spirit of vengeance. You want to avenge your own brother, just like Cain did. You have, you are, you have grudges against your own brother. That's, that's the same thing that Cain did. It was unjustified, of course. You understand? So, now watch this. Give me Ecclesiasticus, okay? Give me Ecclesiasticus 28 verse 2. Sarah 28 verse 2. You cannot say you pray to the Father. You know what? Hmm. Hold it. Give me First John 2. First John. Mm, no, no. First John 4. First John chapter 4 and verse. First John 4 and verse 9. First book of John chapter 4. Verse 9. Read. In this was manifest the love of God towards us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through, through him. So the most High God, he loved us by sending his only begotten son to die for us, to give us a chance to get the kingdom. The second Christ, talk about Christ's sacrifice. That's the love of the Father. Now jump down to verse 19. First book of John, chapter 4, verse 19. Come on. We love him because he first loved us. You see that thing? We love him because he first loved us. You understand? Read that going into Christ's sacrifice that he made. Read on. If a man say, I love God and hated his brother, he is a liar. Read. 
For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? You see what he's saying? If you say you love the Lord, because how do we love God? Give me that in 1 John 5 and 3. Okay, next chapter. Chapter 5 is 3. Watch this. First book of John, chapter 5 is 3. Come on. For this is the love of God. That we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. You see that thing? The love of God is that we keep his command. That's the same thing we read in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. So now jump back up to verse 20 again. Read verse 20 again. First book of John, chapter 4, verse 20. Come on. If a man say, I love God, and hated, and hated his brother, he is a liar. For he that hated not his brother, whom he had seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Because you've never seen the Moses, you've never seen Christ, but you claim you love Christ, you love God, you love the Father, you love his Son. How do you love him? You keep his commandments. These commandments will teach you is the laws that pertain to the Mosai. Watch this. Give me that in uh, Exodus 20, okay? Exodus chapter 20. Let's read that. Now, this is the Ten Commandments. Exodus, the, the laws that pertain to the Mosai. Exodus chapter 20, let's start at verse 3. The book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 3. Go ahead. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. This, this law pertains to the Mosai. You understand? If you love God, you keep his commandments. These are laws that pertain to the Father now. Go ahead. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Read. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above Read. or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You see that thing? It says, don't make anything, any graven image of any likeness of any in, anything that is in the heaven above on the earth beneath. Or in the water under the earth. Read on. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. You see that thing? So he's not saying you cannot make these images because when Solomon was commanded to build the temple, he, he there was graven images in the temple. You understand? The key is, verse 5, it says, thou shalt not bow thyself to them. Meaning don't worship these things. In the air, on the earth, underground, in the waters. Read nor serve them. Uh -huh. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Come on. Vis visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Come on, read. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So the Lord will only show mercy unto thousands of our Israelites that love him and keep his commandments. He's repeating John 14, 15. He's also repeating what? He's repeating um, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Go ahead. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Mm -hmm. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. You see that thing? Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's what he said. That's what we read. Get, go back to Proverbs so we understand what that means. Don't take the Lord, the name of the Lord your God in vain. Proverbs 30. Okay, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 9. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verse 9. Read. Lest I be fool and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of the of my god in vain you see that thing that's what you that's what it means to take the name of the lord your god in vain when you are full you deny the lord you say who's the lord when you are poor you steal and take the name of the lord your god in vain you deny the lord when you're poor you break god's commandments when you are you deny the the most of god's laws when you are full because now you think you the reason why you now you have all these things now when you're poor you say i'm gonna steal you break the commandment that says what? Thou shalt not steal. You understand? Taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. So let's go back. Exodus 20, verse 8 now. Come on. 
the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 8. Read. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. These laws pertain to the Father. Go ahead. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. Come on. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. So now this, this law goes, this is the law of the Sabbath. You brothers and sisters understand that now. The Sabbath day, how to keep it holy. Go ahead. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the, the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So now these laws that we just read, they pertain to the Father. Okay, now let's go back. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 again. Read it one more again. Come on. First book of John, chapter 4, verse 20. Read. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? So if you love God, you'll keep his commandments. You understand? Not only that, you're not going to hate your brother. Because you see your brother on a daily, but you don't see the Lord on a daily. But you love the Lord by keeping his commandments that pertain to him. And you must love the Lord your God by keeping the laws that pertain to your brother about what? Loving your neighbor as yourself. Now give me First John 5 and verse 2. The laws that pertain to your neighbor. Okay, read that. First book of John, chapter 5, verse 2. Read. By this we know that we love the children of God. Mm -hmm. When we love God and keep his commandments. You see that thing? By this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God, how? We keep his commandments and keep his commandments. Commandments pertaining how to love the children of God. How do you love the children of God? Second John verse 6. Let's get there. Let's get some more on this. Okay. He says, loving the children of God. How do we do that? Verse 6. Second John verse 6. Read that. Second book of John verse 6. Come on. And this is love. Mm -hmm. That we walk after his commandments. And this is the commandment. That as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. So now we're going to go over the laws that pertain to your neighbor. You understand? Give me the book of Romans. Okay, give me Romans. Because in Romans, the apostle Paul is repeating what we are, what, what, what Exodus 20 verse 12 down to verse 17 says. Okay, watch this. Romans chapter 13. Romans 13 verse 8. Watch this. Come on. The book of Romans chapter 13 verse 8. Read. Oh, no man anything. But to love one another. Come on. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. He says, he therefore, because he says, oh, no man anything but to love one another. Because if somebody borrows you something and they are expecting it to come back, you don't bring it back, you hate your neighbor. You understand? Because now you are breaking the agreement that you had. Read on. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. This pertains to your neighbor. You understand? It says, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna make mention of those laws briefly, though. Go ahead. Thou shalt not kill. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not steal. Read. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Mm. Thou shalt not covet. Come on. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see that thing? So what he's explaining here, it says, and if there be any other commandment, because he's saying, I cannot mention all of them here, but if there be any other commandment pertaining to your neighbor, it is briefly complimented, comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's how you love the children of God. But if you don't apply any of these, you hate your neighbor. 
You understand? So if you don't apply this, but you say you love God, but you break these laws that pertain to your neighbor, your brother, your sister, you see on a daily, you're full of the devil. You understand? That's what that, that's why the apostle John was explaining. Go back to first John 4, verse 20 again. First book of John, chapter 4, verse 20. Go ahead. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Wait. And this commandment have we from him, that we that he who loveth God love his brother also. You see that thing? That he who loveth God love, love his brother also. You say you love God, you're going to love your brother also because you're going to apply the laws that pertain to the father. You're also going to apply the laws that pertain to your brother. Get that in Matthew, okay? Watch this. Give me Matthew 22, verse, 20, verse 33. Matthew chapter 22, verse 33. Watch this. The book of Matthew chapter 22, verse 33. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Come on. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the, the Sadducees to silence, the they were gathered. So the Sadducees was as, a, as another sect of the Israelites. So you've got here the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. You understand? These were different sects of the Israelites. Right? But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were right. gathered together. They all gathered together. Remember, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, these three groups did not agree as one. They did not speak the same thing. They were in disagreements because they were at odds. But when it came to Christ, they managed to come together because they all had one agreement regarding Christ. They hated him. You understand? So their hatred brought them together. Their hatred for Christ brought them together. Read. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying. You see what he's saying? He's just tempting him. So they are trying to catch something out of his mouth. Math, give me Luke chapter 11, verse 53. Real quick. Luke 11, verse 53. Read that. The book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 53. Come on. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak many things. You see that thing? To speak of many things. They were, they were, it says the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently to provoke him to speak of many things. Meaning what? To be out the spirit. Read. Laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. You see that thing? So they did not have good intentions. They were always planning and plotting evil. They were always occupied with evil when it came to Christ and his teachings and the people that followed him and the disciples as well. Okay, let's go back. Matthew 22 now. Matthew 22 verse 36. The book of Matthew, chapter 22 verse 36. Read. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Mm -hmm. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with thy soul, and with all thy mind. So is they are asking him, which is the great commandment in the law? So now he is what? He's taking them back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Thou shalt Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 down. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and no. I'm paraphrasing it. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Hold on a second. Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse, verse 3. Read that. Let's get that real quick. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 3. We're going to read down. The book of Deuteronomy. You know Let's read verse 4. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5 together. Read that. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4. Read. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Read. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul 
and with all thy might. You see that thing? So he's quoting Moses. Okay, let's go back. Matthew 22, verse 37 again. The book of Matthew, chapter 22, verse 27, verse 37. Come on. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and, and with all thy mind. Wait. Really? This is the first and great commandment. Now you understand what that means now. Because the Christian, that's why the brother, when we were teaching on the street last week, he kept saying, love, love. Let's just love one another. I was like, how do we do that? No, but I love God. How do you love God? But I, I, I love. No, we must just love. Mm -mm. How? We just went over that. You understand? I don't want nobody to get confused. Go ahead. The second is like unto it. Read. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We read that in Romans 13, verse 8 through 9. Go ahead. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He says, hang all the law, meaning the first five books, what Moses taught and what the prophets prophesied. You know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, so on and so forth. Yes, he says, on these two commandments hang all the law, what's written in the law and the prophets, what's written in the prophets. That's what he said right there. So you cannot say you love your brother, but you don't apply. You don't apply the first and great commandment and the second, which is the first, which is love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your mind. The second, love thy neighbor as thyself. If you love God, you're going to love your brother also because you're going to know the laws that pertain to your neighbor. And one of those laws is what? You must forgive your neighbor when he, when he repents and get himself right. When he asks for forgiveness, guess what? You must forgive your brother. You must forgive your sister. Your sister must have that godly sorrow to show forth by their works. So you know what? I, I regret for what I've done and I'm fixing it. You understand? So that's what the Lord is teaching us right there. The civil law. You understand? So let's go back now. Go back to Matthew 6 verse 12. The book of Matthew chapter 6 verse 12. Read. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You see that thing? And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Read on. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that's a beautiful prayer right there. Read that again, verse 13. Verse 13. We're going to get into this thing. Read that. Come on. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 13. Read. And lead us not into temptation, Come but on. deliver us from evil. Mm. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, we're going to deal with this. It says, and lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Because you might be thinking... The reason why you find yourself into temptation is because the Lord is greedy. No, no, no. That's not what Christ is saying. He says, and lead us not into temptation because you might think he's saying the Lord is the one that's leading you into temptation. No. Give me James 1 verse 13. Let's read that. James chapter 1 verse 13. Let's see who leads us into, into temptation. Because if the Lord is the one that's leading you into temptation, you will never take responsibility for your behavior. You'll always be blaming the Lord for everything that goes wrong in your life. You understand? So that's not what Christ is saying right there. Read that. James 1 verse 13. Come on. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 13. Read. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Come on. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Mm -hmm. Neither tempted he, neither tempted he any man. You see what the apostle James is bringing out? He says, let no man or woman say when he is tempted, meaning when you fall into temptation, don't say I'm tempted of God. Don't say the Lord is the one that's tempting you. Why? He says, for God cannot be, cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Because when you, when you say the reason why you are tempted is because of the Lord, 
you are tempting the Lord with evil. You understand? And the Lord is as neither tempted he any man. The Lord is not tempting. But the Apostle James is going to break it down as we read down. Read on. Come on. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Stop right there. You see what the Apostle James is saying right there? He says, but every man or woman is tempted when he or she, not when the Lord is doing it, when you. That's why it says, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Because you are being drawn away. You are being drawn away from what? God's commandments. Your temptation is drawing you away from God's laws. That's what he said right there. It says, when he's drawn away of his own lust and you are enticed by that lust that you in. That's what he said right there. Watch this. Give me Romans 7 verse 7. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Your own lust will draw you away from God's commandments because God's commandments are supposed to instill discipline in you. Read that. Romans 7 verse 7. The book of Romans, chapter 7, verse 7. Come on. What shall we say then? Is mm. the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. Read. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. You see what he's saying? It says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Meaning, is, is, it, is it a sin to teach the law? No, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. So the apostle Paul is teaching us that the only way you can know sin if, if it's the laws of God is taught to you. Read verse 9 so you can understand what he's saying. Jump down to verse 9. The book of Romans chapter 7 verse 9. Come on. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, Sin revived and I died. You see what he's saying? He says, because I was alive without the law once. Meaning he thought he was alive before the laws of God was taught to him or brought to his attention. But when the commandment came, but when God's laws were brought to his attention, he said, sin revived. Why? Because I had not known sin, but by the law. He says, and I died. What does he mean he died? First Corinthians 15, 31. Let's get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, he says, but when the commandment came, when the commandment was taught to me, it says, sin revived and I died. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31. Read what you got. First book of Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 31. Read. I protest by a rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Mm -hmm. I die daily. You see that thing? You must die daily. You must what? Give us this day our daily bread. Because daily you must eat the bread so that you can just kill the old man. Get that in Ephesians 4. Okay, verse 22. Ephesians 4, verse 22. Let's read that. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 22. Uh -huh. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. Mm -hmm. which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. According to the what? According to the deceitful lusts. So this old man must be put to death on a daily basis because the laws of God are brought to your attention. Like the apostle Paul said in Romans 7 verse 9, it says, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. How did sin revive? Because he started, he, when the laws was brought out, he saw the sins that he was in. And then he died, meaning what? He had to kill off the old man, who, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. You see that thing? He had to do that. He had to get rid of that old man. Jump down to verse 25. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Wait. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another you see that thing we are members one of another because we all members of who we all members of christ read on verse 20 jump down to verse 27 now come on the book of ephesians 
chapter 4, verse 27. Oui. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give place to the devil. In the context of what we are reading, what we were reading in Matthew 6, verse 12, when it says regarding forgiveness, guess what? He says, don't give place to the devil because Satan will have an advantage over you if you don't forgive your brother. Go ahead. Let him that stole steal no more. That's repentance right there. That's repentance, right? But rather let him labor. Meaning get a job. Instead of stealing, get a job. Read on. Working with his hands, the thing which is good. Mm -hmm. That he may have to give to him that needeth. You see that thing? Because if he keeps stealing, he's not going to give to him that needs because he's stealing for himself. But guess what? When he stops stealing, he repents, meaning thou shalt not steal, but, but get a job. Now, you, he says what? Working with his, hand, with his hands, the thing which is good, keeping the commandments, getting a job, so that you can do what? That he may, he may have to give to him that needed. You help your nation. You will help your brothers and sisters that have need. Help your brothers and sisters that fall short, because that happens. You understand? So that's what he's saying right there. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is hard for our people to do. This right here is hard for our people to do. They're always murmuring and complaining when they are doing it. The most high God sees that spirit too. Understand that. Okay. Now, let's go back. Romans 7 verse 9. Read that again. The book of Romans chapter 7 verse 9. Come on. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Meaning what? I had to kill the old man on a daily basis because I'm eating daily bread. I'm getting myself right. I'm examining myself so I can what? Get my spirit correct. Jump back up to verse 7. The book of Romans chapter 7 verse 7. Mm -hmm. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Come on. Nay, I, I had not known sin, but by the law. Read. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. He says, for I had not known lust. Remember what James said. He says, every man is tempted when he's drawn away from God's laws by his own lust and is enticed, meaning you partake in it. So what he's saying, he says, I had not known lust, except the law has said, Thou shalt not covet. So, what is the Apostle Paul teaching us here? He's teaching us that lust, where does lust begin? Where does covetousness begin? In your mind. So, because it says, I had not known lust except the law has said, Thou shalt not covet. So, there is letting you know that the law of covetousness affects all the other laws. Because be before you, you covet, when you covet, you don't, you are not, you are not partaking in that covetousness yet. It's still, okay, it's still what is operating in your head. You are coming up with a scheme, a plan. You understand? Because of the lust that's driving you. You understand? Watch this. Give me Exodus twenty verse seventeen, so we understand that lust is covetousness. Covetousness is lust. All the lust that you can, you can think of. All the lust that you go through, we go through on a daily basis is because of the spirit of covetousness. Read that. Exodus 20, verse 17. Read that. The book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 17. Come on. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Read. Nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. You see what the Bible is saying? So covetousness is number one. Is it causes a domino effect to break all the other laws. You understand? That's what he's saying right there. Covetousness will affect all the other laws. That's why it says, I had not known last except the law has said, thou shalt not covet. Covetousness will affect all the other laws. Watch this. Give me the book of Proverbs 24 verse 8. Because the spirit of covetousness begins, it takes place in your mind, in your spirit. You understand? Read that. Proverbs 24, verse 8. The book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 8. Read. 
he that deviseth to do evil shall be called a mischievous person. You see what the Bible is saying? He that deviseth to do evil shall be called a mischievous person because you are occupied with evil, because you are carnally minded. And because of that, you are going to be called a mischievous person. What does that mean? A sinful, wicked Negro. Go ahead, verse nine. The thought of foolishness is sin. Because the things that you devise, hold on, he says, he that devises to do evil shall be called a mischievous person. Because the devices, where do they take place? In your mind. That is the thought of foolishness, which is sin. You understand? The devices to do evil. That's the thought of foolishness is verse 9. Read verse 9 again. The book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 9. Read. The thought of foolishness is sin. Mm -hmm. And the scorner is an abomination to men. Because the scorner is, the, is the, those that hate God's laws. You understand? A hate of God's laws will be abomination to men. Because they hate order, law, and structure, and instruction. You understand? Now watch this. Give me 1 John 2, 16. Let's read that. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. We're going to deal with the lust that will draw you away. Because the Lord is not the one that's tempting you. No, your lust that exists within you is what's drawing you away from God's laws. And guess what? You become enticed by the lust that exists within you. 1 John 2, 16. Come on. First book of John, chapter 2, verse 16. Right. For all that is in the world, mm -hmm. the lust of the flesh and Come the on. lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now watch this. This is for all that is in the world. So these things that are in the world, he's going to tell you, says, the lust of the flesh. So the lust of the flesh is a spirit that comes from the world. It's not the spirit that comes from the Mosa. No, it's the spirit that comes from the world. So it's describing three different types of lust here. The lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, and the pride of life. None of which, none of which is of the Father, but is of the world. Watch this. Let's deal with the lust of the flesh. Give me 1 Peter 2, verse 11. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. First book of Peter, chapter 2, verse 11. Come on. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, mm -hmm. which war against the soul. You see that thing? It says abstain. Stay away from your fleshly lusts, which fight against your spirit, your soul. Because if, if your spirit is not disciplined, we went over this. If your spirit is not disciplined, there's no war between your flesh and your spirit because your spirit must be fed with God's laws so that when the flesh wants to be what when the flesh wants the, the, the lust to be fulfilled, your spirit can say, Hold on, I don't want to do that. Thou shalt not. That's what the scripture says. You see that thing? That's what we read. We are reading here. Read again, verse 11. First book of Peter, chapter 2, verse 11. Mm -hmm. Dearly beloved. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So your fleshly lust, meaning the lust of your flesh, the job of the lust of your flesh is to war against your soul, to go contrary to what? To the laws of God. That's the point right there. But that can only take place if you are applying God's laws to your life. If you're not applying God's laws to your life, there's not going to be a war against your soul because your soul is in full agreement. You understand? Watch this. Give me James 4 verse 1. James chapter 4 verse 1. Here's what the apostle James said about that thing. You understand? Those fleshless lusts that war against your soul. Read that. The book of James chapter 4 verse 1. Mm -hmm. From whence come wars and fighting and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? You see that? He's saying the same thing that the Apostle Peter is saying. He says, where do wars, that's what we read in 1 Peter 2 verse 11, it says, which war against your soul. Where are these wars that war against your soul and fightings come among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts 
plural that war in your members. So there's a there's there's lusts that war that war in your members, in your mind, in your spirit, in your soul. You understand? Because your flesh wants to fulfill those lusts. But when you have God's laws in your spirit, guess what's going to happen? That's where the war takes place because it is a spiritual warfare. That's where the war takes place. But as long as you don't feed your spirit, I'm going to say this again. If you don't feed your spirit daily, you don't keep your own study, you don't apply, you don't examine yourself, there's no war that you are fighting. You are not in no spiritual war. You understand? Okay. Give me Colossians 3 verse 5 now. Colossians 3 verse 5. Read that. The book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 5. Read. Excuse me, sir. Come on, Colossians 3, verse 5. Chapter 3, verse 5. Read. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Hold on. Stop, stop right there. I'm going to show you something with this verse. He says, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Remember what we read in 1 John 2, 16. Anybody still remember? Go back to 1 John 2, 16. Okay, so we don't lose the thought. First book of John. Chapter 2, verse 16. Come on. For all that is in the world. The right last... there. For all that is in the world. The world. The world. Go back to James now. No, no. Go back to Colossians 3, verse 5. I'm going to show you the, the word that the apostle Paul is using and the word that the apostle um, that John is using. You're going to you know, see they are using the same word. They are using... They are describing the same thing, but they are using different words. Colossians 3 verse 5 now, again. The book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 5. Come on. Mortify, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth. Stop right there. He says, mortify your members, which are, mortify, your, therefore, your members, which are upon the earth. You see that it says, for all that is in the world. So John says the world, the apostle Paul says the earth. They are all saying the same thing. So they are going to describe the, the, the lusts that war in your members. Ray, come on. Fornication. Uh -huh. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Come on. Evil concupiscence. And covetousness. Which is idolatry. You see what he's saying? Fornication, that's the lust of the flesh. Uncleanness, lust of the flesh. Inordinate affection, lust of the flesh. Inordinate goes into unnatural, you understand? Ungodly affection. Evil concupiscence, you can, you, there's a class about that, okay? Meaning evil sexual lust. Covetousness, which is idolatry. Isn't that what we read in Romans 7 verse 7? It says, I had not known lust except the law has said, thou shalt not covet. So lust, covetousness, all of which, all of that is idolatry. It breaks the first commandment in Exodus 20 verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods. You understand? So it's a domino effect. Covetousness will affect what? Will break the first commandment. Then the first commandment will cause you to do what? will cause you to break all the other commandments, will cause you to break the Sabbath, will cause you to uh, disobey your father and mother, will cause you to steal, you understand? Will cause you to kill because you covet your neighbor's house, you covet your neighbor's wife, you covet your, you covet your neighbor's men and maidservants, his ox, his sheep, his ass, you okay? And anything that is your neighbor, you will kill your neighbor for that thing. All because of the spirit of covetousness, which is idolatry. You see that thing? It's a domino effect. That's what we're reading right there. Because all of these, 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 these uh, members here, these, these, these spirits, these evil spirits, they, they draw you away from God's laws. Why would they draw you away from God's laws? Think about it. What's the spirit behind that? Watch this. Give me the book of Hebrews, chapter, chapter 11. Watch this. Hebrews 11 and verse 26. No, no, verse 25. Hebrews 11, verse 25. Watch this thing. The book of Hebrews, chapter 11, 
verse 25. Come on. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God mm -hmm. than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see that? Than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. So sin is pleasuring. But it's not going to last forever. You're going to drop dead if you don't repent from that sin. But it is pleasurable though. It feels good. It's, sin feels good. But the Lord is saying, you're going to enjoy the pleasures of sin that is only going to last for a season. That's why the, the lust of your flesh, all the members, your lust will draw you away from God's laws because sin is pleasurable when you partake in these members that you must mortify in Colossians 3 verse 5. Watch this. Give me James, okay? J give me James 4 verse 5. Watch this. The book of James, chapter 4, verse 5. Come on. Do you think that the scripture said in vain, mm -hmm. the, the spirit that dwelleth in us lasteth to envy? He says, the spirit that dwelleth in us, it lasteth to envy. Envy what? Jump up to verse 4 as an example. The spirit that dwell in us, he's not talking about this, the spirit of the Lord. He's talking about the spirit that, that last. Those, those last that we read, those members that we must mortify, that's the spirit is talking about. It lasts to end. You understand? Jump up to verse, verse 4 as an example. The book of James, chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Mm -hmm. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You see that thing? That, this goes into what? Fornication, uncleanness, boyfriends, girlfriends, sex outside of marriage and so forth, uh, masturbation, pornography, all of that. All manner of sexual lust and sins and all that. Mm -hmm. All of which breaks the first commandments because all the root cause, the root cause of this sin is what? Covetousness. Because once you covet, you'll envy. You understand? You'll envy the what? The things that the world offers. Once you envy the things that the world offers, you get what? That's your lust. Then you are enticed by it. Once you are enticed, you're going to be drawn away from the laws of God to partake in that. When you do that, guess what you're doing? You're provoking the Lord to anger because now you are provoking the Lord to jealousy. So what, which law are you breaking? The first commandment, thou shalt have no other God because now that thing is your God because you're willing to reject and forget God's laws to go and fulfill that lust. You see that thing? That's how this thing goes down. It's all connected. Now, watch this. Here's another one, okay? The tongue, the mouth. Because yes, this is also the last of the flesh, the tongue, the mouth. You understand? Give me James 3, okay? Give me James chapter 3. James 3 and verse... James 3 verse 5. We're going to read 5 and 6. The book of James chapter 3 verse 5. Read. Even so the tongue is a little member mm -hmm. the, and boasteth great things. Wait. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Mm. So the subject matter here is the tongue, the mouth. Because some of you, you the mouth, you cannot control your mouth. You understand? You cannot control your mouth. You don't know how to be quiet. Some of you men, you're moving in the spirit of the woman. You understand? Even some sisters, you know, some sisters, sisters have improved a lot when it comes to that now. I'm seeing a lot of improvements in terms of the mouth. Some of you brothers, you're still struggling with that. What the hell is this? Okay, read that thing again. Verse five, read it. Come on. The book of James, chapter three, verse five. Come on. Even so the tongue is a little member. Mm -hmm. And boasteth great things. Wait. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. So your the, the tongue, 
will kindle a fire. Read the next verse. Watch this. Come on. And the tongue is a fire. Mm. A world of iniquity. Stop right there. He says, a tongue is a fire. A world of iniquity. So the tongue will kindle a fire because on the tongue is what is a world of sin because it boasted great things like we read in verse 5. Where the scripture, I think it's in Matthew, right? Let me see something. There's a scripture in Matthew. Let me look at it real quick. Might be Matthew verse 13. Let me see something real quick. Mm. Yes. Give me Matthew 12. Okay, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. The book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 36. You know what? Start of verse 34. We're going to read 34. The book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 34. Read. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? One. How can ye, being evil, being speak evil. good things? The subject matter, no, I need you to follow me. Being evil, you stop right there. It says, oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil? So Christ is cutting the scribes and Pharisees because there was a bunch of evil Negroes, okay? We don't do what? How can ye, being evil, speak good things? So the subject matter is that they are evil. What make, what's making them evil? Their tongue. That's why it says, speak good things. You are evil, you cannot speak good things. Watch this. Why is he saying that? Come on. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You see that thing right there? He says, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Whatever is in your mind, your mouth is going to utter it. Why? And if, if your mind is full of corruption, you're going to utter corrupt things. That's what Christ is teaching right there. That's what the apostle James is explaining. Okay. Go back to James chapter 3, verse 6 again. The book of James, chapter 3, verse 6. Read. And the tongue is a fire, mm -hmm. a world of iniquity. Same. Come on. So is the tongue among our members. Among our what? Among our members. Brothers and sisters in the congregation, so is the tongue among our members, read. That it defileth the whole body. Because the tongue will destroy the, what we are trying to build here, the whole body, the congregation, the body of Christ, read. And setteth on fire the course of nature. He's going to change the course of nature. That's what the Lord is saying, read. And it is set on fire of hell. That's how dangerous the mouth is. Jump down to verse 8. Come on. The book of James, chapter 3, verse 8. Ray. But the tongue can no man tame. Mm -hmm. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Remember it says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So in order for the tongue to be tamed, what needs to happen? Give me Ephesians 4, verse 23. In order for the mouth to the tongue to be tamed, something must take place first for the tongue to be what? To be chastised and to be disciplined, to speak when it's necessary. Now read that. Okay. The Ephesians 4, Ephesians. verse 23. Come on. The book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. Read. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what needs to happen. Your mind must be renewed in God's laws. If your mind is not renewed to get rid of that old man that must be killed on a day to day, guess what? Your tongue will not be changed because your tongue speaks the things that are in your mind. If your mind is occupied and filled with evil, your tongue is not going to speak good. That's why Christ said, you being evil, how can you being evil speak good things? You cannot. You cannot plant an orange and a banana pops out. Impossible. You cannot smoke weed and all of a sudden you smell like strawberries. That's, not, that's impossible. You understand? 
You smoke weed, you're going to smell like a black ashy demon. Is that is very proportional? You see that thing? Read that again. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 23. Come on. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You must be renewed in the spirit of your mind because your mind must change. Your spirit must change. You understand? Everything that you do about you must change and mirror what this Bible is saying. Read on. And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's the goal right there. Second Corinthians 5, 17. Let's read that. Second Corinthians 5, verse 17. The tongue is not going to change. The tongue is not going to speak anything different if the mind is not renewed, if the mind is not changed. Read. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17. Go ahead. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Come on. Behold, all things are become new. You see that thing right there? It says, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's why you see on the news, you see a lot of sisters be coming and saying, no, when I was three years, when I was 10 years old, I got raped by such and such. Sister, how old are you? No, I'm 38 now. Hold on a second. So you 38 years old, you are bringing something that happened when you were 13 years old, right? You understand? So the reason why they keep doing these things, I'm not saying what happened to them when they were 13 was correct. No, it's obvious that was wicked as hell what happened to them. It was evil. But this is how we heal those old wounds. Read it again. This is how those old wounds are going to be healed because I'm seeing a lot of that now on the media. Lake. Okay, read that. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 5. Verse 17. Come on. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, mm -hmm. he is a new creature. Come on. He's a what? He is a new creature. If any man be in what? Therefore, if any man be in Christ. If any he, man, if any man be in Christ, what needs to happen with our brothers and sisters in the world? Because they've made a friendship with the world. And the world encourages that. The world does not encourage healing. The world does not encourage letting go. The world does not encourage renewing your mind and your spirit so you can be a new creature. Because they are in the world, they are not in Christ. That's why they are always to dig, they are able to dig up things that happened 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 20 years ago. They are married with kids, but they will bring up something that happened when they were seven years old. Why? Because they are not in Christ. You understand? Somebody was molested 13 years ago. Well, I mean, 13 when they were 13 years old. Now they are a 40-year-old man. They are a 40-year-old woman. Guess what they are doing? They are bringing up those things because those things never got healed. Because why? They are not in Christ. They are in the world. They've made a friendship with the world. So the world will do what? The world will encourage you. Yeah, speak about it, girl. Yeah, do that. I've seen Tyler Perry do it on Oprah, speaking about how he, when he was young, he was all of these things because they are not in Christ. That's why. The Bible is about change. You understand? The Bible is about letting go of those things when you apply God's laws. Read again. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17. Come on. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, mm -hmm. he is a new, is a new creature. Is a what? He is a new creature. When you are in Christ, you are a new creature. That's why when you come into this truth, now you are, you are coming to know, you are coming into the body of Christ. Now you're going to learn the laws, your identity, the laws, the sins you are in, and learn, you enter into the journey of repentance. So now, as you are getting yourself right, you're getting your mind right and so forth, you cannot keep bringing up things that happened to you when you were 13. Things that happened to you when you were 15 years old. No, no, you are a new creature. Because the reason why I'm bringing this up is because some of you, I'm talking to the sisters and the brothers as well. You get married, you something is happening in your marriage, but you keep bringing up things that happened in your past to manipulate what's happening currently. 
to manipulate your husband, to manipulate your wife. You understand? So those are the type of things that you need to look out for before you get married to make sure that that sister is a new creature and they, they believe that they are. And the things that have happened in the past, they've let those things go. The brothers as well. Because they can use that as a way to manipulate the man or the woman that they are proving to get married to, to spend their rest of their life with. That's some evil stuff right there. You understand? Okay, read that again, verse 17. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 17. Read. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, mm -hmm. he is a new creature. Come on. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become anew, are become new. You see what he's saying? He says, behold, all things are passed away. So the traumas that you had in the past, you understand? They are, they, whatever it is that you went through in the past, the Lord says, now that you are a new creature in Christ, he says, all these things must be passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Meaning everything about you must be new. You understand that? Get that in Philippians, okay? Let's read that. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Watch this thing right here. What the apostle Paul said about this thing. Because I'm bringing this out because you understand, this thing right here is the reason why you find that a lot of the times marriages are stagnant. Marriages, they don't prosper. Marriages have problems. Why? Because a brother or sister, they have issues of the things that happened to them in the past. And not brothers, not so much. Sisters do that a lot. Okay, read that. Philippians 3, verse 13. Come on. The book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 13. Read. Brethren, I count not myself to have, to, uh, to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, mm -hmm. forgetting those things which are behind. Doing and what? Forgetting those things which are behind. Doing what? What's that word? Forgetting. What? Those things. Forgetting. What's that word? Forgetting. What? Forgetting. 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 Forgetting meaning let it go. That's what the Lord is saying right there. Forget. Forget it. Let it go. You understand? Forgetting those things which are behind. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Read on. Come on. Forgetting those things which are behind and mm. reaching forth unto those things which are before. Meaning what? The gift that the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now that you the, the Holy Ghost bring into your remembrance who you are and what is required of you before the Lord. Next verse. Come on. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see what he's saying? So he says, stay in the spirit. Focus on the prize, meaning what? The kingdom, everlasting life. Focus on that. Some of you, you cannot let go of the things that happened to you in the past. You're still holding on to them because you are using those things to manipulate your current situation. You better watch them spirits, okay? Watch this. Give me that in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 16. Come on. For which cause we faint not. We faint not. Meaning what? Don't lose faith. Don't faint. Don't lose your steam. Don't lose the fire. Go ahead. But through our outward man perish. No, no, no. But though our outward man perish, meaning what? The old man, that must be put to death. Go ahead. But though our outward man perish, mm -hmm. yet the inward man is renewed day by day. No, how long? How many times? Day by day. On a daily basis. Give us this day our daily what? Our daily bread. It says what? Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Day by day. Every day that inward man must be renewed. Meaning what? The new man that you have put on because all things are passed away. Daily, you must die daily. He's saying the same thing. 
He's just repeating himself over and over. You understand? So the reason why I was bringing that up is because you have to renew your mind. The reason why your tongue, go back to James 3 verse 8 again. Okay. The book of James chapter 3 verse 8. Ray. But the tongue can no man tame. Mm -hmm. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Full. When something is full, that means there's no room for something else. No, it's just that. It's full. It says the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Because if your, your, the things you say is what's in your mind. If your mind is not in you, if that old man, if that inward man is not in you day by day, guess what? Out of the abundance of the heart, which is what messed up, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, because your tongue is unruly, will spew out deadly poison. Watch this. Give me Sarah 28, verse 17. Ecclesiastes chapter 28, verse 17. That's why it's very important for sisters to be what? To be silent and loving. You understand? To be able to, to be well-mannered, disciplined, reverence their husbands, their fathers, the leadership. You understand? The men must not be running your mouth like a little girl. Watch this. Give me that in uh, Sarah 28, verse 17. Read that. We're going to deal, we're still dealing with the tongue. Because some of you, that's your, that's, that's your disease right there. Read that. Sarah 28, verse 17. Come on. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 28, verse 17. Read. The stroke of the whip maketh marks in the flesh. Mm -hmm. But the stroke of the tongue breaketh the bones. Now that's heavy right there. You see that? Is that? The stroke of the whip will make the mark in the flesh. You understand? It will be visible. But it says, but the stroke of the tongue breaketh the bones, the mind. Give me Proverbs 17, verse 22. This goes into verbal abuse in a marriage, okay? Verbal abuse, them things, that thing right there, that's the spirit of Satan. Verbal abuse, that's the spirit of Satan. Basically, verbal abuse is a reflection of that man or woman that they themselves, they hate, they, they, they are telling you that I hate myself. That's what they are saying to you. That's how you must look at it going forward, okay? Proverbs 17, verse 22. Watch this. Come on. The book of Proverbs, chapter 17, verse 22. Read. A merry heart doeth good like medicine, like a medicine. <laughs> come on, come on. But a broken spirit dryeth the bones. You see that? But a broken spirit dryeth the bones because the spirit is broken. You understand? The spirit is broken. So what I don't want to see, sisters come into the truth. Usually the sisters go through stuff like that. You understand? You are a happy chappy. You understand? Now you come into the truth. All of a sudden, you are just, you are just this grimy person. Yeah? The spirit of joy is gone. The spirit has been quenched. You understand? I don't want to see that. Sisters, you must have that spirit of joy. You understand? Brothers, those, that are you, those of you that are married and those of you that are not, make sure. Don't be killing the sister spirit. Don't kill the sisters. Don't destroy the sister spirit. The sister now is like she's just gone. We cannot even recognize it. And I'm not meaning the new person which is supposed to have joy, supposed to have made to be merry. You understand? To look forward to classes, to look forward to studying and so forth. No, no, no. Mm -mm. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where there's not even a spirit of joy in the house. Mm -hmm. That's some evil stuff. Because you travel in your own house. Where's that verse? At? Let's get there. A man that travels in his own house shall inherit the wind. I want to deal with that. Give me, give me that thing. Hold on a second. Yes. He that travels in his own house shall inherit the wind. Give me a second. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's not in my notes, so it just popped into my head right now. So, oh yes, hold on a second. Yes, give me that in Proverbs 11. You know, I've got brothers online, you know, they are not helpful at all. 
Proverbs 11 verse 29. Read what you got. All praise to the Lord this day. Read that thing. The book of Proverbs chapter 11 verse 29. Go ahead. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. You see what the Bible is saying? You trouble your own house, God says you will inherit the wind. You understand? Because some of you men, you are highly emotional. You understand? You better get rid of that spirit. Because if you are a highly emotional brother, you will trouble your own house. You will trouble your own house. You understand? Go ahead. And the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. You see that thing? So brothers, don't trouble your own house. Everything is just tense in the house. Mm -mm. You must instill the spirit of joy in your house. You understand? You must do that thing. The joy is a spirit. Being merry is a spirit. You understand? Joyfulness and gladness of heart. So don't be quenching the spirit. Okay? Love with your wife. Love with your Lord. So on and so forth. And you brothers that are not married yet, you better get your mind right. You better make sure that I want to see that spirit of joy. Some of you, your countenance is like you are seeing a dead dog or you are smelling a dead dog. What is wrong with you? Have a spirit of joy. Mm -hmm. You understand? It's like all the time when I see you, it's like something is smelly because your countenance is like you're smelling something. If you're not smelling something, your Wi-Fi is online. Your forehead is all messed up in the Wi-Fi. The whole time you're always connected. And the, the signal is always strong. Come on, brothers. Get your mind right. Have the spirit of joy because you won't have in your own house. I'm telling you right now. Okay, let's go back to Sarah 28. Ecclesiastes chapter 28 and verse 17 again. Okay. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 28 verse 17. Read. The stroke of the whip maketh marks in the flesh. Hmm. But the stroke of the tongue breaketh the bones. Breaketh the mind, meaning we'll break the spirit. Read. Verbal abuse. That goes, this goes into verbal abuse. You're troubling your own house. You understand? Because you don't want to admit that your spirit is, you have not repented from that spirit yet. Okay, go ahead. Many have fallen by the edge of the sword. Come on. But not so many have fallen by the tongue. You see that thing? Many have fallen by the edge of the sword. I mean, think of war. But he says, no, that's nothing compared to those that have fallen by the tongue. Because remember, it says the tongue is full of deadly poison. Go ahead. Where is he that is defended from it? Meaning, where is he that is defended from what? The tongue that is unruly. That unruly tongue. Where? And has not passed through the venom thereof. Because the, the tongue will, will produce venom. That's what it says, full of deadly poison. Venom is poisonous. Read. Who has not drawn the yoke thereof, nor has been bound in her bands. Okay, come on, read. For the yoke thereof is a yoke of iron, mm. and, the, and the bands thereof are bands of brass. You see that thing? Because guess what? Some sisters, I'm going to deal with the sisters just for a second, second. Some sisters, they don't know how to shut the hell up. Excuse my French, but they don't know how to be quiet. They don't know how to shut up. You understand? Your husband says one thing, you say something else. He says this, you say something else. You cannot just be quiet and just listen, take on the instruction. You can't. You always have to say something even when it's not needed. You understand? Give me that in Sarah 32. Verse 7, now that we're on this. Brothers as well. Okay, some of you, you are going to trouble your own house because you are emotional. You don't want to repent. So like 32 verse 7. All we can do is warn you. Read that. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 32, verse 7. Come on. Speak, young man, if there be need of thee. Mm. And yet scarcely when thou art twice asked, that's the commandment right there. Meaning, you don't need to speak all the time. Is a speak, young man, if there's a need for you to speak. So that goes for the sisters as well. Speak, sister, if there's a need for you to speak. 
Sometimes, you know, a lot of the time, just be quiet and listen. Because men, we're simple. We want silence. We want sex. We want submission. That's it. Silence, sex, and submission. Simple. You see how simple this equation is? Very simple. And support. Silence, sex, silence, sex, submission, and support. That's it. You understand? That's it right there. Very simple equation. Okay? Watch this. Because, watch this. If, if you cannot do that, here's what's going to happen. Read that in Surah 25, verse 20. Could you imagine this type of house right here? Read it. Surah 25, verse 20. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 25, verse 20. Read. As the climbing up a sandy way is to the feet of the aged. Mm -hmm. So it's a wife full of words to a quiet man. You see that thing? Is the so is a wife full of words to a quiet man. Imagine you don't really speak that much. What I mean by that is that you don't always have to, you know, your house is, is, is not, you're not like that, but your wife is. So now it's like he it says, it's like, it's like climbing up a sandy way. Is as climb is as, as the climbing up a sandy way is to the to the feet of the aged. Because a sandy as a sandy terrain to the feet of the aged, I mean you're gonna get exhausted. You're you're gonna start to feel your knuckles your ankles, your knees, your thighs, you're gonna feel the pain, the bend and so forth. You'll be exhausted uh, quickly and you are, you are aged. It says it's the same thing as a wife that is full of words to a quiet man. That thing will just vex your spirit. I'm telling you right now, okay? That thing will vex your spirit. Okay, let's go back. Drag in it, reverse. Read verse 20 again. Sarah 28, verse 20. Come on. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 28, verse 20. Go ahead. For the yoke thereof is a yoke of iron, and the bands thereof are bands of brass. That's going into the tongue. That will break the mind. Go ahead. The spirit. Read. The death thereof is an evil death. Mm. The grave were better than it. Because the tongue will break the spirit. So he says the death of the tongue is, is what? Is that the death of the tongue is an evil type of death. He says the grave were better than it. So the death that where you have to go into the grave, he says is better than your spirit being broken by the what? By the tongue. Being verbally abused. You see that thing right there? The most High God says that that type of death is worse than the physical death when you have to go into the grave. So you brothers that are yet to get married, you better make sure that you get your mind right, you control your tongue, cleanse your mind. You brothers that are married already, make sure that your house is not like that. Where you, you've, got a, you've got a smart mouth. You understand? You have a smart mouth. You're spewing verbal diarrhea. When you open your mouth, the whole house is just you know vexed. Why? Because you full of the devil. You understand? Read on. It shall not have rule over them that fear God. Stop right there. It says the tongue will not have rule. The, an evil, an unruly tongue will not have rule over those that fear God. Because if you fear God, you will apply what is written. Speak, young men, if they be in need of thee. You will apply that commandment. Go ahead. Neither shall they be burned with the flame thereof. Because it said, remember, it says the, the tongue is a little member, but it kindled the fire. It set it on fire, the course of nature. Read. Such as forsake the Lord shall fall into it. If you forsake the Lord, meaning you are drawn away with it by your own lust, because I know some of you forgot. We're still dealing with James 1 verse 13. I mean, James 1 14. I have not forgotten the point. Okay. It says, such as forsake the Lord shall fall into it. Meaning we're going to fall into what? The, the, the fire that the tongue kindleth. Read. And it shall burn in them mm -hmm. and not be quenched. Not going to be quenched. Come on. 
it shall be sent upon them as a lion mm. and devour them as a leopard. You see that thing? That's how powerful the tongue is. That's what the Lord is explaining to us right here. If the tongue, the, when the, that tongue is unruly, is not tamed. The only reason why it's not tamed is because the mind is not disciplined. Your mind is not changing. You are still the same wicked, grimy Negro that you were in the world. You come in Israel, you look the part, but what? You are a beautiful demon. You understand? Now, watch this. Give me first, go back to first. We dealt with the lust of the flesh. The tongue is part of that. It says the lust of the eyes. Give me Job 31 verse 1. Job chapter 31 verse 1. The lust of the lust of the eyes. Okay. Job 31 and verse 1. Let's read that. Come on. The book of Job chapter 31 verse 1. Read. I made a covenant with mine eyes. I did what? I made a covenant with mine eyes. He says, I made an agreement with my eyes. Remember, it says the last of the eyes. Read. Why then should I look upon a maid? He says, why? No, no. He says, why then should I think upon a maid? Why should you? Because when you look, you last. You think now. And are you thinking good things? No, you're not thinking good things. You look because you look to last. That's what he's explaining. He says, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Because from looking, it went to work to thinking. That means lust is involved. Between the looking and the thinking, lust was the carrier. Lust was the bridge to move from look to think. Lust was the bridge. Idolatry. You see that thing right there? He says, if I do that, what's going to happen? Jump down to verse 9. Now. Come on. The book of Job, chapter 31, verse 9. Mm -hmm. If mine heart have been deceived by a woman. Come on. Or if I have been laid wait at my neighbor's door. You see that? He says, if mine heart have been deceived by a woman. Which woman? The one that he looked and then he started to think, to think, to lust, to, to, to have lustful thoughts about the sister. It says, if my heart had been deceived by a woman, or if I've laid wait at my neighbor's door to do what? To sleep with my neighbor's wife. Because from looking, you started to lust. Once you last entered in, guess what? Now you are acting on it. Now you are waiting on your neighbor's wife to sleep with your neighbor's wife. Go ahead. Then let my wife grind unto another. Come on. And let others bow down upon her. You see what the judgment is? So here you are, you married, but you're still looking. You still have the lust of the eyes. You understand? Once you look, you lust. Guess what? Your mind will be occupied with that. The law says this, is the judgment. It says, then let my wife grind unto another. And let others bow down upon him. Meaning what? Let your wife sleep with somebody else, somebody else, and let other men bow down upon your wife. Meaning what? They must sex it. That's what the Lord is saying right there. You understand? That's what the Lord is saying right there. So some of these things we bring them upon ourselves. A lot of them, by the way. A lot of these things we bring these things upon ourselves. Okay. Read verse eleven. For this. Is an, is an heinous crime. Yea, it is an iniquity to be punished by the judges. Because now the leaders of Israel must judge this matter that you cannot lay wait for your neighbor's wife to defile your neighbor's wife. That's what he goes, that's adultery. You understand? That's adultery right there. That's what he's explaining. So go back to 1 John 2, 16. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. First book of John, chapter 2, verse 16. Come on. For all that is in the world, mm -hmm. the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes Wait. and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. You see what he's saying? He says the pride of life. I'm going to touch on that just for a second. 
I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Go back, give me Sirach 11.24. And the pride of life. The pride of life. What does that mean, the pride of life? Read that, Sirach 11.24, as an example. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 11, verse 24. Come on. Again, say not, I have enough, and possess many things. And what evil can come to me hereafter? That's the pride of life. Because you have all this position and then you saying to yourself, no evil is going to touch me. Because of, of all the gold, the silver, whatever, the riches I got, I'm going to, he says, no evil will touch me because all these things that I worship, all these things that I can brag and boast about, they are going to protect me in the day of judgment. They will not. You understand? They are not going to protect you on that day. That's what the Lord is saying right there. But the pride of life will teach you that. The pride of life is what we read in the prayer in Psalm 73. He says, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They say, who's the Lord? Is there any knowledge in the Mosa? Okay, come on. Verse 25. In the day of prosperity, there is a, for, forget, a forgetfulness of affliction. You see that thing? In the day of prosperity, he says, you forget affliction. Why? Because you say, I have enough. No evil will come unto you. Go ahead. And in the day of affliction, there is no more remembrance of prosperity. Why? Because you worship them things. You worship those things. That's why when affliction comes, you don't remember when everything was good. Ray. For it is an easy thing unto the Lord in the day of death to reward a man according to his ways. So the Lord says, when you do that, the Lord says, he's going to reward you according to your ways. So what is the way here? Being double-minded. That's the way. Being double-minded. Not being steadfast in your understanding, but you are what? You are, you are being tossed to and fro. You are not rooted and grounded yet. That's what he's saying right there. That's the pride of life. Okay, now let's go back to James now. James chapter 1 verse 14. Now that we understand this thing, then it says, and lead us not into temptation. Because when you are led into temptation, is because of the lust that war in your member. Okay? James, chapter 1, verse 14. Come on. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 14. Read. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. You see that thing? Now you understand that all these precepts that we went to was to explain verse 14 right there. Go ahead. Then when lust has conceived. When lust it, is what? Then when lust, when, when lust has conceived. When lust is conceived, that's what we read in Proverbs 24 verse 8. When you devise evil. When you devise evil, you'll become, a, you'll be called a mischievous person. So now it says, when that lust has conceived, because you devised it in your head. When it says conceived, what happens? It bringeth forth sin. Because you want to partake in that sin because sin is pleasurable in only for a season though. Right? And sin, when it is finished, bring it forth death. Because you're going to die in that sin. You will die in that sin. I'll give an example, right? Give me that. Let's, let's read about Asmodeus. Hmm. Asmodeus, the evil spirit. Because this is our four, this is our foremother, our sister, Sarah. Okay. She slept with, no, no, she didn't sleep, but she got married to seven men who all died in the marriage chamber. So I'm bringing this out because I want to bring this out to you for those brothers that can, you cannot stop choking the peacock. You busy choking the peacock, you cannot stop. You are busy being enticed by big booty women, you cannot stop. Here's the thing. Give me Tobit 6, okay? Watch this. Give me Tobit 6 and verse... Read verse 13, okay? Tobit 6, verse 13. Let's read that. The book of Tobit, chapter 6, verse 13. Go ahead. Then the young man answered the angel, I have heard, brother Azarias, that Azarias. the snake, brother, brother Azarias. Azarias, go ahead, that this maid has been given to seven men, who all died in the marriage chamber. 
So now he says they all died in the marriage chamber. So they, they never slept with the sister. Although they got married, but obviously they needed to go into the marriage chamber to consummate the marriage. Before they could consummate the marriage, while they were in the marriage chamber, they died before they could consummate the marriage, meaning what? Before they could what? Deal with the sister. You understand? Okay, watch this. Now give me Toby 3, verse 8. Toby chapter 3, verse 8. Read it. The book of Toby chapter 3, verse 8. Read. Because that she had been married to seven husbands, whom Asmodeus, the evil spirit, had killed. Stop right there. Whom what? Whom Asmodeus, the evil spirit, had killed. Whom Asmodeus, the evil spirit, had killed. You see, some of you, mm, I know it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. Sisters are going to come into the truth, right? Some of you, your lust is going to be activated. Because right now, I mean, we do have sisters, but the sisters will, more sisters are going to come because we see that when we go to the streets. Now, here's the thing. Some of you, you will ignore the counsel that will be given to you. And guess what will happen to you? This will happen to you. You say, no, I love the sister. I know she's attractive and all that. No, no, no. That sister's crazy. Give it time. You just go against the leadership counsel. Mm -hmm. As more as the evil spirit will put you to death. Understand mm -hmm. that some of you brothers that are choking the chicken, you can choke the chicken for the last time because you'll be watching the porn, bumping and grinding. And guess what? You choke the chicken, that will be your last choke. As more as the evil spirit will put you to death while you are watching those booty, big booty women on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, so on and so forth. Read again, verse 8. Come on. The book of Tobit, chapter 3, verse 8. Read. Because that she had been married to seven husbands, whom Asmodeus, the evil spirit, had killed. Come on. Before they had lain with her. Before they dealt with, because before they consummated the marriage, while they were in the marriage chamber, Asmodeus, the evil angel, put them to death. Read. Dost thou not know, said they, that thou hast strangled thine husbands? Because they were mocking our sister Sarah. But that's, the, that's it right there. I just wanted to show you that, listen, you know why I'm bringing this out? Give me the book of Tobit 6, verse 17. Watch this. Tobit 6, verse 17. The book of Tobit, chapter 6, verse 17. Read. Right? And the devil shall smell it mm. and flee away come on. and never come again anymore. Mm -hmm. But when thou shalt come to her, rise up both of you and pray to God, which is merciful. Read. Really? Will have pity on you and save you. Come on. Fear not, for she is appointed unto thee from the beginning. Stop right there. It says, because she was what? Fear not, for she is appointed unto thee from the beginning. Some of you. You are, you are going to be given counsel. You will ignore the counsel. And will say, no, 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 don't, not that sister. That sister is right, is good for you. That sister will be good for you. That brother will be good for you. Some of you, you will just ignore that counsel because you don't know she was appointed unto thee from the beginning or he was appointed unto you from the beginning. But guess what? Because you ignore the counsel, you don't want to follow the counsel, you will marry a beautiful monster. You see that thing? Yeah. Some of you brothers, you're looking at the outward appearance. I'm not saying there won't be attraction, but you're looking at the outward appearance, but that's only your focus. Then you go into the marriage chamber, and then Asmodeus, he pays you a visit. <laughs> Listen, brothers, you better pay attention to what's coming out here. You understand? You don't want Asmodeus to pay you a visit. Okay? Because you might not drop dead physically, but you can spiritually drop dead. You can spiritually check out. So keep that in mind too. Oh, okay. Keep that thing in mind. Keep that in mind. Go back to James now. James chapter 1. Okay. James chapter 1 and verse 15 again. The book of James chapter 1 verses 15. Go ahead. 
then when the last con when the last hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Mm. And, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You see that thing? When sin is finished, when you partake in that sin, the last of the flesh that is only for a season, guess what? Remember, it will draw you away from the laws of God. That's the point. Don't forget the point now. It will draw you away from God's laws. Once you are drawn away from God's laws, guess what happens to you? You are by yourself. You're vulnerable to sin because you now left the protection of the, the Bible. You did that thing. Okay, come on. Verse 16, read. Verse 16. Mm -hmm. Do not err, my beloved brethren. You see what the Bible is saying? Read that again, verse 16. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 16. Read. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Do not err, my beloved brethren, meaning do not sin. Don't sin. Don't let that sin, don't, let, don't allow that lust to take you away from God's laws. Now you find yourself, because you are going to be vulnerable to sin. Now, your body is going to be subject to that sin. Now you're vulnerable. Guess what? Is going to bring forth death. So the apostle James is saying, do not what? Do not err, my beloved brethren. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Don't err. Don't allow your sin to take you away from God's laws. Because the Bible is, a, is your safety net. God's laws is your shield of protection. You understand? Get that in Psalms, okay? Give me Psalms 28 verse 7. Psalms, chapter 28, verse 7. Read. The Lord is my strength and my shield. Mm -hmm. My heart trusted in him. Come on. And I am helped. Mm. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiced. And with my song will I praise him. You see that part right there? It says, it says what? It says, the Lord is my strength and my shield and my heart trusted in him and I am helped. I am helped, meaning the Lord will deliver those that keep his commandments, those that are, are faithful to him. The Lord says, I'm going to deliver you out of the temptation that you're in. The Lord will deliver you. Watch this. Give me that in First Peter. okay? The Lord will deliver you. If you're faithful to the Lord, you're sincere, you're keeping God's commandments, the Most High God will surely deliver you. Uh, but the sinner will not be delivered. First, Second Peter 2, not First Peter, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Watch this. Second book of Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. Come on. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Out of what? Out of temptations. He says, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. That's why when we read the prayer, it says, lead us not into temptation. Because the Lord will deliver the godly out of it. If you are a sinner, you will be taken by that sin because you've been drawn away from the laws of God because of your lust and you are enticed by it. You are partaking in it. You understand? Read again verse 9. Second book of Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. Go ahead. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Temptations, plural. Read. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. You see what the ungodly, the injustice, the ungodly, it says what? They are going to be reserved for the day of judgment to be punished. So let's give some examples. The, the our forefathers that the Lord delivered out of temptations. Jump up to verse 7. You know what? Read verse 6. Jump up to verse 6. Watch this. Second book of Peter, chapter 2, verse 6. Go ahead. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, mm -hmm. condemned, mm -hmm. condemned them with an overthrow, mm -hmm. making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. That's good. Just talk about us in these last days. So when Sodom and Gomorrah was overthrown, was what? Was an, was, was an example for us in these last days so that we don't fall into the same trap. Ray, come on. And delivered. Just Lot. What did he do? And delivered just Lot. He delivered 
just Lot, because Lot was a just man. Give me that in Ezekiel 18, and delivered just Lot. When it says just Lot, it doesn't mean he only delivered Lot. No, no, no. Ezekiel 18, might be verse 4 or 3. Let me look at it. Yes, Ezekiel 18, verse 5. Come on. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 5. Read. But if a man be just mm. and do that which is lawful and right. You see that? So, Lord, he did that which was lawful and right because Lord was a just man. So, go back to first, second Peter 2. Okay, verse 7 again. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Read. And delivered just Lord, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. So Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And the only reason why he was vexed is because he was a just man. He did that which was lawful and right. So he knew the law. So when they were having conversations like the conversation that go on now in the world, on the media, TikTok and so forth, is filthy conversations. They are not having godly conversations. So as a righteous man, as a just man or woman, you're supposed to be vexed by those filthy conversations and separate yourself from them. Go ahead. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from the day, from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You see what he's saying? So Lord, he says, Lord dwelt among the evil. He dwelt among and the ungodly. And the ungodly says he saw he saw the ungodly partake in their evil deeds and he had the evils that they were speaking about, their filthy conversation. It says, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Remember, it says, day to day, you're supposed to do what? You're supposed to renew the inward man. So if day to day, you're not doing that. Remember, our brothers and sisters in the world, right? When it comes to evil, listen, they go all out and they do it on a day to day. So you're supposed to do what? Daily, you're supposed to eat the bread, the Bible, the laws, the statutes and commandments, and stay in touch with your brothers and sisters. Why? Because that's going to help you to stay in the spirit. You understand? So, but the Lord delivered just Lord in, in the midst of all of that because lost was occupied in God's laws. Now watch this. Let's get what, 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 what he said when he says delivered just Lord. Let's get there. Get Genesis 19 now. Genesis chapter 19 verse 8. No, no, not verse 8. Genesis chapter 19 and verse, verse 12. Read that. Genesis 19 verse 12. The book of Genesis chapter 19 verse 12. Read. And the man said unto Lot, hast thou here any besides the book of Genesis chapter 19 verse 12. And the man said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whosoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Now these are the angels that were coming to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and to deliver Lot and his what? His family, right? Go ahead. For we will destroy this place mm. because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. Come on. And the Lord had sent us to destroy it. This is the same thing. Remember, this is during the time of what Sodom and Gomorrah. These, 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 ty these type of angels to come and destroy cities and all that is the same angels that are holding back destruction in Re Revelation 7 verse 1 and 2. They are holding back destruction. He says, head not the earth until we have sealed the servants of... Get that real quick. Hmm. Hold on, wait. Let's finish that. I'll deal with that later on, okay? I don't want to confuse things. Let's go, keep reading. The book of Genesis, chapter 19, verse 13. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord had sent us to destroy it. Jump down to verse 15. The book of Genesis, chapter 19, verse 15. Read. And when the morning arose, when the angels hastened Lot 
saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. You see, you see what he's saying? Because remember, the, the, the sons-in-law, when Lord was telling them, listen, this city is going to be destroyed, they did not believe him. They were mocking him. So he said, okay. So the angels, he says, the angels came and they hastened Lord, meaning they were rushing him, saying, arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Go ahead. And while he lingered, while the he man, and while he lingered, while he lingered, meaning what? He was not moving with the spirit of haste. He was not making moving fast. While he lingered, he was still enjoying himself while he lingered. Go ahead. And while he lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. The Lord being the, what? The Lord being merciful unto him. The reason why the Lord sent the angels to go and deliver Lot and his family was because of the Lord's mercy. That's why it says the Lord being merciful unto him. Guess what? We are going to get delivered because of the Lord's mercy upon us. Not because of our good righteousness. Not because of our righteous deeds. Mm -mm. Because of the Lord's mercy. The same way he had mercy upon Lot and his family, that's the same mercy he will have for us in these last days. Go ahead. That they brought him forth and set him without the city. And they brought him forth and set him forth and set him without the city, meaning they took him outside of the city. Okay, come on. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Remember, they, they, they told the instructions, says, don't look there, don't look back. Don't look back. Guess what? Spiritually, some of you, you keep looking back at your own life. How your life could have been if you didn't come into this truth. Oh, I wish, you know, I would have had money. I would have had fame. I would have been a celebrity. I would have been this. I would have been whatever the case may be. You still keep looking back. So spiritually, you are like Lord's wife. You keep looking back. When the command was, don't look back. What did we read in Philippians 3.30? 3, what did we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17? It says, old things are passed away. That's what they are explaining here. You understand? Spiritually, that's what is being explained. Pay attention. Okay, jump down to verse 22. Read. The book of Genesis chapter 19, verse 22. Read. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore the name of the city who called Zohar was called so now, So you, you notice that the angel had to literally grab Lord and his family to put them out of the city. Because it says, Lord, Lord, he lingered. But the Lord being merciful unto him, Lord got delivered. You understand? Out of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He was not affected by it. Go ahead. Verse 23, read. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zohar. Mm -hmm. Read. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. You see what the Lord did? How he overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah? He says, fire and brimstone came out of heaven. This is during the time of Sodom. This is thousands of years back. Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed with fire and brimstone. Go ahead. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and mm -hmm. that which grew upon the ground. So the inhabitants of the cities were, were set on fire and everything that grew upon the ground was also set on fire. Read on, verse 26. But his wife looked back from behind him. What did, he, what did she do? But his wife looked back from behind him. What was the command? Don't look back. But because she was, um, she was, she, she said, no, no, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to just make my own decisions. She looked back. What happened to her? Go ahead. 
And she became a pillar of salt. She became a pillar of salt. That's what happened to Lot's wife. Because remember, Lot was rich. He was wealthy. You understand? So they had lands. They had everything. So there was not um, poor. There was rich. So she was thinking back of the riches that um, her, her husband has. You understand? She was thinking about all of that. She was not looking at the fact that this city is, being, is going to be set on fire. She became a pillar of salt. You see that thing right there? So what I'm showing you here is Lord got delivered out of that. He says he delivered just Lord because Lord was a just man. He was a righteous man. He was a righteous brother. So he was that. The reason why he was able to be delivered was because of this. Jump down to verse 29. Watch this. The book of Genesis chapter 19 verse 29. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham. Stop right there. I want to show you. We see our forefather Abraham. Our forefather Abraham was on another level. What, read that verse again, verse 29. I'm going to show you why Lord was delivered. Watch this. The book of Genesis chapter 19, verse 29. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that right. God remembered Abraham. God remembered Abraham. What, he, what is he remembering? What is, what he, why is he remembering Abraham? What is he remembering about Abraham? That he remembered the conversation that he had with our forefather Abraham, the chapter before. Get Genesis 18, verse 32. We're going to just, our forefather Abraham was negotiating here about that, you know, if there's, there's um, one righteous, if there's 50 righteous, you understand, will you spare the city? So on and so forth. He was negotiating. He was pleading with the Lord. Now read verse 32, Genesis 18, 32. You can read the whole chapter on your own. Read. The book of Genesis chapter 18, verse 32. Come on. And when he, and he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet this, and I will speak yet but this once. Read. Per adventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten sake. So he's negotiating with our forefather Abraham. He says, if there's 10 righteous people in those cities that you want to destroy, will you destroy the whole city? Then the Lord says, I will not destroy it for 10 sake. You understand? So, but none of them was righteous except for Lord, his wife up to a point and, and the daughters and everybody else had to be, had to go. Because there, there was no way that that could stop. Meaning the judgment was already set. The, the evil of Sodom and Gomorrah has reached up to heaven. The Lord said, okay, it's time to destroy. Send the angels down there. But the reason why Lot was delivered out of it is because of the negotiation that our forefather Abraham had with the Lord. That's why Lot was delivered with his, with his children and with his wife, which, made, which didn't make it because she looked back. But the reason why Lord was delivered with his family, except for the wife, is because of the conversation that our forefather Abraham had with the Lord. That's the level of righteousness and meekness our forefather Abraham had. And he was called the friend of the Lord. So much so that because of that, Lord was delivered. Go back to Genesis 19 verse 29 again. The book of Genesis chapter 19 verse 29. Read. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain mm -hmm. that God remembered Abraham Come on. and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow mm -hmm. when he overthrew the cities of when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. He destroyed, he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. He destroyed those cities. The reason why Lot was delivered is because of what our forefather, the conversation that our forefather Abraham had with the Lord. That's why he was delivered. That's why Lord, the Lord had mercy on our forefather, on, on Lot, his nephew, the Abraham's nephew. The mercy, that the mercy, let's get there. Luke 172, because we read that. I know some of you forgot now already. 
Look one. We read it earlier. You understand? I'm going to show you that. Look one. So we understand this thing. Lord was able to be delivered because of our forefather Abraham. Watch this. Luke chapter 1 and verse, verse 72. Come on. The book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 72. Read. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers mm -hmm. and to remember his holy covenant. Come on. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham. You see that thing? So the reason why Lord got delivered was because of the mercy that the Lord, that is because of the what? Is because of the friendship that the Lord, that Abraham, our forefather Abraham had with the Lord and because of what? Because of the promise that the Lord made to Abraham regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's why Lord, his nephew, was delivered because of that. You understand? That's why Lord was delivered because Lord was a righteous man. Now let's go back. First Peter's. Okay, but I did say I, I was going to touch on something, right? Let's just touch on it real, real quick. I'm just going to dabble on it. Get Genesis 19 now, verse 28. The book of Genesis, chapter 19, verse 28. You know what? Before we get Genesis, get Second Peter's. I'm going to preface it with this. Second Peter's 2. Okay, Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 2nd Peter 2, verse 6. Read that. Second book of Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Read. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them in, with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. You see that thing? The reason why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed was because of what? was because the Lord was was what? Was giving us a warning and example for the ungodly. Lord. This is how you're going to get punished, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, if you don't get your mind right. That's what he's saying right there. You understand? So the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was an example for us in these last days, that we must not live ungodly, because if we do, we also going to what? We are going to suffer the judgment that will come upon the new Sodom and Gomorrah. Get Genesis 1928 now. The book of Genesis, chapter 19, verse 28. Read. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of the of a furnace. Because that's when Sodom called Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord reigned fire and brimstone. You understand? Upon the city says, the smoke of the destruction, he says, it went up. You understand? They could see the smoke of Sodom and Gomorrah. Watch this. Now, you see that part right there? Give me the book of Isaiah 13 verse 19. Give me Isaiah now, chapter 13 verse 19. This is the prophecy. Give me Isaiah 13 uh, verse 1. Then we're going to jump. Of Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. So the subject matter is about Babylon. Babylon the Great. Jump down to verse 19. Go ahead. The book of Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19. Read. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the Chaldee's excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You see that thing? So he is prophesying about what? Babylon. Because ancient Babylon was not destroyed with fire. It was not destroyed like oh, Sodom and Gomorrah. It was not destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. Ancient Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar. So he's not talking about that. He's talking about Babylon the Great, the United States of America. Okay? Get Revelation chapter 18 now, verse 18. You know what? Get Isaiah 34. Get Isaiah 34, verse 4. Okay? Isaiah 34, verse 4. The book of Isaiah, chapter 34, verse 4. Read. 
and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. That's a mushroom cloud. That mushroom cloud is going to be caused by thermonuclear destruction. When America is going to be bombed by all these nations that are going to go to war with America. You understand? Read. And all their hosts shall fall down. That as goes the... into their satellites. Their hosts is going into their satellites. Go ahead. As the leaf falleth off from the vine. Mm -hmm. And as a falling fig from the fig tree. Come on, next verse. Read. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Shall be bathed in heaven. That's, that, this is when Esau is going to be judged. That's, this is when America is going to be judged. This is when Cain is going to be judged. Because Cain has not been judged for his crime yet. This white man is Cain. Back on this earth before the flood. Before he was, before he had, it was, before he can account for his crimes. On this day, that's when Cain will pay for his crimes. Cain is the white man this day. Go ahead. The book of Isaiah, chapter 34, verse 5. Read. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumia mm -hmm. and upon the people of my curse to judgment. You see that thing? And upon the people of my curse to judgment. This day is when the wicked are going to get their just reward. You see that thing? They are going to be overthrown just like Sodom and Gomorrah was overthrown with fire and brimstone. Revelation 18. All of what happened with, what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah is for our example today in these last days because that's how America is going to be destroyed. Babylon the Great. Because that's what is called in the Bible. Revelation 18, verse 18. Watch this. The book of Revelations, chapter 18, verse 18. Go ahead. And cried. You know what? They... Read verse 10. Read 10. We're going to jump down to verse 18. The book of Revelations, chapter 18, verse 10. Read. Standing afar off for the fear of, of her torment. Read. Say, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. You see that thing? That's when the Lord shows up now while the nations are at war. The Lord, that's when he shows up, he says, he's going to wipe America out in one hour. Mm. They took them 400 years to build it. The Lord says, no, in one hour, I'm going to destroy the whole land of America. Guess what's going to be left when America is destroyed? Read verse 18. The book of Revelation, chapter 18, verse 18. Read. And cried when they saw the smoke of a burning, saying, mm -hmm. What city is like unto this great city? You see that thing? It says, and, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning. Isn't that the same thing that we read in Genesis 19 28? That's the same thing. And when, when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, what was left? The smoke. That's what we're reading here. That's what's going to happen to America, Babylon the Great. That's what's going to happen to America. Now go back to 2 Peter 2. I'm going to shut it down now in a second. 2 Peter 2, verse 9. 2 Book of Peter, chapter 2, verse 9. Come on. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Read. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. The Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation. The Lord knows how to do that. So if you're keeping God's commandments, you're sincere, you are fighting the good fight, guess what? When you find yourself in some sin, you can see you are in the midst of it or you almost fell into it or you find yourself in it, the Lord will help you to deliver yourself out of it because why? You failed in patience at that point. The Lord will deliver you. But if you don't feel no remorse, you don't see anything wrong with what you're doing, the Lord will leave you right there to be punished. You see that thing right there? I'll give an example. One more example. Get the book of Genesis, right? This is Abimelech. Okay? This is Abimelech. When our forefather um, Abraham went to see Abimelech with our foremother, right? Watch this. Get Genesis 20. Genesis 20, verse 1. 
the book of Genesis chapter 20 verse 1. Oui. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shu, and sojourned in Gerar. Come on. And Abraham said unto Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So now Abraham is telling, uh, uh, telling our foremother here, his wife said, listen, when we get there, because he did that during the time when we had to meet Pharaoh and so forth, when, we, when they came into the land of Canaan in Genesis 12. So he's doing this, he's pulling the same, um, the same uh, um, strategy because it worked. So that's why he's repeating it again. So now Abimelech, king of Gerar, is sent and took Sarah, our foremother. Read on. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. Stop right there. Remember, he said, that's my sister, meaning that's not my wife. Okay? That's why Abimelech, king of Gerar, took, came and took Sarah. Okay? Now watch what happens while, now when Abimelech goes to sleep. Go ahead. Read again verse 3. The book of Genesis chapter 20 verse 3. Come on. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night mm -hmm. and, and said unto him, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. Stop right there. You know, the most has got a sense of humor. <laughs> He's paying this man a visit because this man took um, our foremother. You understand? So now the Lord paid him a visit. Listen, you're going to die, Negro. You are but a dead man. Imagine what type of a dream is that? <laughs> thou <laughs> but art, that is a what? Thou art but a dead man. Mm, that's a scary dream right there. Go ahead. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. You see what is? You see what the Lord is telling him in a dream? Is it because the woman that you have taken, she is a man's wife? Keep reading. Come on. But Abimelech had not come near her, mm -hmm. and he said, "Lord, would thou slay also a righteous nation?" You see what he, Abimelech is saying? He says, but Abimelech had not come near her. Meaning what? He did not sleep with our former. You understand? So this is what Abimelech said in the dream. And he said, Lord, will thou slay also a righteous nation? Go ahead. Said he not unto me, she is my sister. Really? And she even, and she, even she herself said, he is my brother. Come on. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands have I done this. Is that the reason why I took the woman is because he said, he's my, that's my sister. And she also said, that's my brother. So I did this out of the innocence of my heart. That's what he's saying, right? Read on. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. Stop right there. Oh. Because, hold on, the, the most that God is able to what? The Lord does not look on the outward. He looks on your spirit. What type of spirit you're rolling in? And here, the Lord was able to see the spirit of Abimelech. That's why he's saying, yeah. He says, yeah, I know that thou did this in the integrity of thy heart. Because the Lord searches the mind. Right? For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Stop right there. You see that? He says, because there is why, uh, he says, because I withheld thee from sinning against me. Meaning I stopped you. I delivered you out of that temptation. I'm the one that made you not to sleep with this woman. I'm the one that did it. Read on. Come on. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. That's why I allowed, I made sure that you don't touch her. So I just wanted to give an example of the Lord will stop you from sinning if your mind is right. If your mind, you are do, dealing with the spirit of sincerity and in truth, the Lord will deliver you out of the temptation. Understand that. You understand? Go back to Matthew 6 now. Matthew 6. Okay. Matthew chapter 6 and verse... Matthew chapter 6 verse 13. Come on. 
the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 13. Read. And lead us not into temptation, mm -hmm. but deliver us from evil. Read. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All praises to the most High God. All praises to the Lord this day. Because the Lord was delivered out of temptation. You understand? Abimelech was withheld from sinning because the Lord does that. You see that thing? The Lord always knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Always. That's why okay. the prayer says what it says. Read verse 13 one more again. Okay. The book of yeah. Matthew, chapter 6, verse 13. Uh, so, okay. John, can you mute your mic? Because you keep messing us up here. Come on. Read that again. The book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 13. Read. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. Come on. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. The Lord will be the, the Lord will deliver you out of temptation and he'll deliver you from the evil that you that you're gonna find yourself in. The Lord will deliver you before you enter into that evil. Read. For thine is the kingdom. For the kingdom is of the Lord, read. And the power. Uh -huh. And the glory. Come on. Forever. Amen. Mm. Amen. Selah. All praises to the most high God. I'm going to end the class right there. Let's break bread. Let's break bread. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Let's break bread, brothers and sisters. All praise to the Lord. First book of Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it, in, the, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do so the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.